Let's bring this meeting to order. This is the June 15th, 2021 New Report Conservation Commission meeting uh, taking place on the Zoom platform. And this meeting is being recorded. Uh, first item on the agenda is are the minutes from June 1st, 2021. Do we have any uh, changes, corrections? All right, hearing motion to approve. Second. All right, uh, roll call. Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. And I vote yes. Um, all right. Next item, uh, we are going to skip the Plum Island updates to the end. And um, we're gonna give uh, 15 minutes to Evergreen Commons, the Cottage of the Port Place to discuss what we need to discuss. Okay, so I'm going to promote Lisa Mead to a panelist, as well as if anyone else is here Steve Sawyer, um, and I'm not seeing Tom Hughes yet. It would be that he's just not here yet. But um, Lisa and Steve, you can speak uh, to this. I believe Tom's, I just got a Tom's logging on right now. Okay, great. <clears throat> Which is great because he's the uh, lead, he's the lead actor tonight. Yes. Yeah. He prepared this memo yes. um, that we have in front of us and I'm hoping he will be able to run through it pretty briefly because I know there's a lot of content in here, but we, we have a big agenda. So we really don't want to spend more than 25 minutes. Is that right, Joe? He's in the attendees, Julie. Okay. All right. All right, Tom. Okay. What do you need panelists? <clears throat> All right, Tom, you got 15 Tom, minutes. You, you can just let me know. I've got the plans. Um, I've got everything you submitted. So you can let me know how you'd like me to scroll through. But first, first you'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, there we go. All right, good evening. Tom Hughes with Hughes Environmental. Um, sorry, I had a little trouble logging in. Um, okay, so um, first of all, what we try to do is is respond to um, the issues within the letter. Some of them are conservation related issues and some are not. Some are more like punch list um, items for the uh, HOA to, to work through with the developer. Um, but so so with regards to that, what I tried to do is take the comments that were from the letter and try to provide a response to each one. And I don't know if you want me to like go through each response or just if we want just want to scroll through. Um, you know, there could were. You, yeah. Could you focus on the ones that are germane to conservation commission? Related? Yeah. So so that's um, they're not in they're in the order that were that was in the letter uh, that was submitted to the commission. So why don't we just start? So right in front of us we have. Um, with regard to grading, site grading. Um, so the grading on the site in some areas is extremely flat. Uh, the, the rough grading was all done with, um, or largely done with GPS guided equipment. Uh, it was really pretty accurate, um, but there's not a lot of tolerance for, for any kind of errors in that. Um, you know, during finished grading, uh, in most of it, it's a large site. Most of it actually came out really well. And then where we saw areas of, you know, ponding or any kind of, uh, you know, adjustments needed to be done, we've, we've done those on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, there is, there's elevation control on site. Um, the, you know, the contractors have taken care, but, you know, keep in mind that we have some areas with long shallow swales that are, you know, at a half a percent slope and uh, uh, Steve Sawyer is also on the meeting so he could talk about some of those things um, if you'd like uh, but uh, moving down um, many areas that do not drain um, so there were some areas uh, 
that did not drain. Part of it was a challenge because um, during review of the of the project, the the city engineer asked that we not install dry wells on the um, you know on the site and instead use uh, use a long swale to to bring the water that's mainly on the eastern side of the, the property uh, and connected into the stormwater system rather than infiltrating water closer to the well. So, you know, we've done that, but with a half half a percent grade on the um, on that swale, it's not that difficult for something to uh, to interfere with that. My understanding is there's an irrigation control box that um, slightly interfered with that swale. Um, and I know that the contractor uh, is actually working on uh, fixing one area where there's where there's ponding that we know of. Um, okay, if we can go on to the, the next. Um, with regard to water in the basements, again, it has to do with it being a flat site. Uh, my understanding is all those issues have been resolved. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a matter of, of getting water into those swales and dealing with a relatively flat site. Um, if we can move on to the next. Uh, so with regards to, you know, the roof runoff, we've got the 18 inch strip that uh, was shown on the approved plans. Um, let's see. Trying to see on, um, again, with regard to um, ponding areas on site and, and, um, and whether or not areas are, um, are holding water, you know, we, we inspect the site, I inspect the site personally once a week. And when I notice areas that were repeatedly ponding, I, I uh, put those into the reports and they, uh, they get addressed by the developer. I, that hasn't been happening for for a while except that one area that's in a finished part of the uh, project behind I think it's lots 35 or 37 but the um, and the recent work we've done in the open space has uh, pretty much gotten rid of any long-standing ponding uh, out in the open space as well um, so this next comment is about that ponding area and the developer is looking at at that and we'll uh, We'll be adjusting the grades to make sure that the ponding water is not within the uh, the residential lots. It doesn't. We looked at it over Memorial Day weekend. We had about three inches of rain over a course of three days, and um, the day after the rain stopped, there was a small pot, puddled area, and uh, the day after that, it was gone. So, it's not a big area, but it is an area where there's some ponding on, uh, you know, right near the bound at the back of the. The property is certainly not as big as was shown on the exhibit um, that was in the letter to you. With regard to the trees that are planted in those areas, the uh, the open space trees, there were three species and they range from pine at FAC up and I can't remember the other two, but uh, there's one that's FAC and one that's FAC wet. All of them can take uh, brief duration ponding and flooding. Um, you guys are, are aware we have wetlands with the white pines in them. So I'm not worried about that. And the water is not around long enough to, uh, to impact them. Um, we can kind of skip pot past this next one. It was already addressed prior to the letter being received. Um, same with this one. Uh, same with that one. Um, Tom, when you say that it's been addressed, um, you mean that the developer is like taking some um, steps to remedy whatever this the complaint yeah is. yeah and, and and in in mr brown's letter he acknowledges that um that the dry well that was installed in one area behind one home is as resolved okay. those uh those issues i believe all right uh, so in the interest of time i'm just trying to skip yep. by Very good. um let's see so um Common areas. So within the common areas, I'm not aware of any remaining ponding areas that that hold water for three days. There's a couple small areas that, when it rains, they will puddle a little bit out in the open space, um, but it disappears pretty quick. Um, 
Uh, with regard to the grading and slope of the walkways, that's just not a conservation issue. Um, we have made some changes. Uh, we do have to meet the AAB standard. Um, it's not feasible to make those access areas uh, meet AAB, but we have provided a change to the path. There uh, is some finished grading needs to happen with that, and that's what that next bullet point's about. Um, right now, the path has been installed, but it does need to be, the surface needs to be finished and in that process. We'll be, um, we'll be making sure that everything complies with the standards we have to comply with. Uh, you may recall this was never intended, nor was it um, approved as an ADA or an AAB path, but um, as a result of, uh, of concerns raised by, uh, by the HOA or, or a resident, uh, you know, we, we are addressing the AAB standard. Um, with you regard to- You are addressing the standard? The AAB standard, yes. Um, but we did that, if you recall, as a minor revision included an adjustment in the path route at the northern end of the site. We've provided an accessible entry at that area by, um, instead of having the Y that came down the hill, we kind of run along the slope. There may need to be some fixing. I don't know what the cross slope requirements of that AAB requirement are, but um, they'll be met for that area. Um, with regard to the um, to the bridge and erosion, I've been inspecting that on a weekly basis. There's no erosion of the of the stone dust at the um, stone at the interface with the bridge. The way that is is there's uh, filter fabric underneath, stone along the side. There's a uh, granite curbing up against the wooden timber, and we expect that in the first you know year or so after installation that the um, the stone dust will settle a little bit. It has, and when we finish the the path surface, uh, they'll you know that will be brought up. But there's no erosion issue. Certainly nothing of any significance in those areas, and I think the commission saw those areas during the site site visit we had uh, not too long ago. Um, moving on down um, with regard to vegetation coverage between the common areas of Route 95, um, there's a whole bunch loaded into this. Uh, we've been reworking the open space. The reseeding is coming along great. The, the oats, which were a uh, spring additive to the seeding, uh, have come in beautifully and I can see the pollinator uh, seeds are, are sprouting within and between the oats and uh, the commission may remember there's a uh, procedure for uh, for mowing and things like that in the first year of seeding that are related to uh, establishing that pollinator seed once the oats reach a certain height we'll be uh, mowing that back um, then will erosion control measures be installed to keep soils from washing we have been installing erosion controls as necessary. You may recall there is no waters of the US on site. There is an isolated wetland that is jurisdictional to the commission that we have essentially recreated. Um, and we uh, also established the 25 foot buffer pretty successfully around that around the same time. So uh, there really has been no major erosion events and certainly nothing that's affected the isolated wetlands function. Um, and uh, in other places, we do have silt fence installed on site. There's one area south of Rain Garden C where it does need to be installed. And I've called that out in my recent reports and that will be going in soon. Um, they also are all functioning well. I observed them after rainstorms and they all drain within the 72 hour de by design. Um, they are in need of some maintenance. Uh, the mulch is supposed to be refreshed um, and that is part of the HOA landscaper uh, contract, I believe. Um, I also do note that in Ray Gardens DNE, I've called out in my reports and communicated to the developer, and I think it's been communicated onto the HOA that there's Phragmites that's popping up in Rain Gardens D and E, and that does need to be tackled ASAP before that comes a larger site-wide issue. I pointed it out first when it was just in Rain Garden D and the Rain Gardens were weeded, but not entirely, and some of the Phragmites remained. Um, that really does need to be dealt with uh, very quickly. Um, so with regard to, um, was the IVW designed to have vegetation? Yes, it was. There was a, a vegetation plan. It was planted. 
cattails have taken over the area and, and we visited the site with uh, Julia and Jennifer early on and, and I think we all agreed it wasn't feasible to try to get the shrubs to grow in there given the, the increased hydrology that we had and it has vegetated very well and that vegetation should stay there um, and no, it should not be cut. Um, with regard to sidewalk issues, that's not really a conservation issue. Um, and, you know, before we close out the project, the project engineer will be making sure that everything was built according to plan. Um, and with regard to trees and shrubs that are dying, um, we've been evaluating them. One of the attachments that I sent to you was the current state of evaluation out there. Um, and we have some that we're monitoring, some that have been completely replaced already. We did not do a lot of planting last year because of the drought. Um, and some of the stuff that was done during the first year, um, we did have one person working for the landscape company who was, uh, so who was supervising the crews and some of the uh, trees that were installed during that period were not installed completely properly. So any of those that have died, we, um, we have uh, replaced and anything that uh, you know, that is not doing well, we're monitoring and evaluating, you know, what the next steps on those plants are. But certainly before we come in for a COC, we're certainly gonna have to show you that we've got the survivability and we've got all the vegetation in place. Um, the next one is kind of related. There are some trees where the, you know, the holes in the, and the, that they were planted in were not uh, exactly per plan. And um, we've, largely replaced a lot of those, but um, any of the ones that are still surviving, we're just evaluating. The, the, the whole size is really important for establishing the plant. Once it's established, the plants really don't rely on that little area around the trunk. It's really, you know, you want the roots to get out into the parent soil and, uh, and for the, uh, the trees to survive. So there is a point after which um, that hole becomes irrelevant. Um, but it is really important in the first uh, couple of years of life, and we've been we've been evaluating those. Um, again, the plant pits is the same same issue. Um, uh, so, with regard, this is one where he, he talks about the root crown being too low. I'm not aware of any that haven't been replaced already where the root crown is too low. But if there are any, and he wants to point them out to us, we'd be happy to take a look at them. Um, the only thing where the root crown is intentionally low is uh, the planting, foundation planting of roses, but that's something the landscaper pointed out. So um, we're, we're, Tom, excuse me, we're, we're yep. going to need to wrap this up pretty soon. Um, yep. And I'm going to give Mr. Brown uh, two minutes to uh, speak if he wants. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to, I, it's, it's, this is a tough thing to like jump by um, every, you know, which, which items to jump and which ones to address. So uh -huh. um, I think all of these have to do with planting details. Some of the things have been corrected, like the, the mulch and all that. And um, others, I'm a little confused as to whether or not the mulch depth is an issue of the HOA landscape maintenance, whether they're putting mulch on top of old mulch or whether um, you know, our landscape company claims that they've installed the mulch per plan, um, I think three inches of depth. Um, if we can go continue on here. Um, again, this is all the same thing about planting and all that. And again, the, the main takeaway is when we come in for a certificate of compliance, we're going to have to demonstrate to you that the plants are healthy and, and, and planted as as per plan. Um, uh, with regard to cleaning up any dead trees and brush around the site perimeter, I'm not aware of any brush piles that exist that were a result of the development or any trees that were cut down or as a result of the development. Um, certainly nothing of any significance. And uh, if there are dead trees and brush around the site perimeter, um, they should remain there because it's just part of the ecosystem and it's an open space that's supposed to be in a natural state. Um, if there are areas where people feel that it's a result of construction, we can look at that and see if it should be removed. Um, construction debris and trash needing to be removed, it, that's uh, on an ongoing basis, that's something that is pointed out in my SWIFT reports and the developer follows up, um, usually same day, but on picking up things that are 
included in the report. Uh, it's a pretty windy site, so occasionally we do get plastic debris that, that blows around. Um, soil piles, um, dust has not been much of an issue recently since the, the site is largely stable. Early on, it was a challenge, but there, we had water that was being applied. We used uh, a number of other methods to, uh, to try to keep uh, dust under control, but it, it's no longer really a significant issue on site. Um, exposed piping, that's like a, that's, that's one of those punch list issues. Um, and I, so why don't we just wrap up the last thing that the playground sub drainage around the playground. I've looked at that playground after a number of rainstorms and it's not holding water anymore. Um, I've put in there, you know, the response. I know the last issue that was of significance, things like the soil compaction. Um, you know, we've put in the contractor's description of what he did um, and soil chemistry, the, the landscape uh, company has uh, applied some material to try to adjust soil chemistry based on, on uh, testing done by them. Um, and I've given some additional description. I think given you want to wrap it up, maybe we could just turn it over and, and uh, you could let the uh, Mr. Brown and anybody else speak yeah. and then be happy um, to answer questions. Mr. Brown, I'm going to give you two minutes. We have a very long agenda tonight and we're already uh, seven minutes past the, the initial section. Okay, thank you for letting me uh, speak tonight. I'll just be very quick. I think that this document uh, outlines things that need to be looked at by uh, the commission as we go through approvals. One statement I would like to make is that the HOA landscaper is not uh, installing, maintaining, or putting bark mulch around the trees, uh, nor, nor, nor will they be um, taking out phragmites. It's really the responsibility of the developer to do that. And I would think that the landscape contractor uh, probably doesn't have experience in how it should be extracted in terms of getting its roots out. Uh, the presence of phragmites um, is concerning to me uh, for our project uh, in the future. And it needs to be done by someone who really knows how to uh, remove it. Um, with regard to uh, drainage between lots 36 and 37, the drainage problem occurred before the irrigation was installed. It continues to occur. And, you know, I don't want to go through every item here and I will not do that, but I will tell you that the ADA issues are a major concern that I have and the HOA has uh, on the development. I had a meeting with William Joyce, who's the executive director of the Massachusetts Architectural Board in 2020 to specifically go over this project with regard to walkways and ADA access. And basically what he, what he said- Brown, is that, I'm, I'm gonna stop you there because that's not really a conservation issue. Okay. Um, it's probably more of a planning board um, issue. So um, I think you should take it up with, uh, with them. With them, okay. Um, so I think that we need to discuss all these issues that are contained within uh, Mr. Hughes's letter and our letter. The commission needs to be aware of it um, and should be considered as you go through the approval process for the project. Um, I don't think that we're going to stand, sit here and talk about and discuss each uh, item one by one and come to a resolution, but it's really um, information for the commission to evaluate as so you go through the process of approving the project. Yeah, we, we will you. certainly do that. And I'd like to thank you for um, submitting all those comments because we do have to go through a process of making sure everything was done correctly before the certificate of compliance is issued. And your list of concerns helps us sort of hit a lot of these points with the applicant um, or the developer before the project is complete. So we'll be going through all of this again with them and doing a complete site visit prior to um, the certificate of compliance. And again, this is helpful, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, thank can you. I make one comment before we go? Um, Tom, I was out there this afternoon, took a walk around. Yep. And on that, that hillside where I guess where people were sliding last winter. Yeah. Um, the, there's some fresh erosion of the path and the stone dust is making its way down 
towards the wetland. Right. And so, I suspect that after the rain we just had, it's even worse. Yeah, so that is going, at, it's actually going into a stone area that is just up from the stormwater wetland near the plunge pool. Yeah. Um, and um, that is an area where we're looking at a retrofit right, right there. Um, and if you look, we actually, um, if you can see to the right of that, there's a low area with stone, which we have put to trap anything washing from the, from the hill. That's something we're aware of, and we're looking to um, retrofit that likely with a little bit of a stone pocket on the left, a pipe under the path, and then another stone pocket on the right. Basically taking the water where it collects and currently runs over the path and trying to get it under the path. Um, but that's something we're aware of and we're, and we're looking to fix. A lot of these issues, this is a big site. It's a you know complex project overall with a lot of parts to it. And we are trying to deal with things on an ongoing basis and trying to uh, move things forward and, uh, and finish things up. I mean, we're sort of, we're past the rough sandpaper and we're past maybe the medium sandpaper, but there's still some fine, fine tuning to do uh, in different areas. And this is one of them. And my other comment is it needs to be resolved quickly who's responsible for getting rid of that track mines. No, absolutely. I 100% agree. Basically, the um, my understanding is because the O&M plan for the rain gardens requires regular weeding and refreshing of the mulch. Um, and that the O&M, and, and it really is the lack of weeding that has allowed those things to go be from one little small seedling that was initially pointed out into what it is. Um, and the roots and plants do need to be removed. And I'll be talking to the developer, but I'm sure he'll also be talking to the HOA and somebody does have to deal with it. Um, and it can't get lost in the sort of battle back and forth between the two over that issue. So. Hey Tom, what's the schedule for the certificate of compliance? Is that something that's so we had talked to um, to uh, Julia earlier on about um, applying for the um, for the house lots that are finished. Originally, we were doing it phase by phase, and we were talking about at least trying to you know clear the the homeowners' deeds by doing. Uh, a partial COC for as many of them as are finished and complete and have no issues. Um, but then we have to, um, we still have a number of things. The conservation restriction is still in process. Um, we do need to do some more planting um, or, or some more sort of landscape in areas that are um, just minor areas, but are still being worked right now. Um, so you're looking at you know, partial as soon as the the commission staff is comfortable with us going forward with the partials on individual lots and um, and the complete one would follow. I mean, we do have to have survivability of certain plantings and everything. So whether we do a partial for everything and then a final after so many years of, you know, two growing seasons of plant survival is something that we'll, we'll certainly talk to you guys about about how to go forward. I don't have an actual date by which we'll be filing the final COC. Okay. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Tom, though, the a final COC, according to the order of conditions, has to be filed before a certificate of occupancy for the final house. Okay, so in which case it would be, we would file for a final COC, um, but we would work out something for any kind of survivability issues on the plants with the commission um, I think maybe it's just a perpetual condition or something like that, but there has to the right. there, there well, can't just we can't end this with partial certificates. Right. I believe the last house is currently scheduled and and I think Lisa is is on the meeting. I think it's December. The end so, of the year, right. So um we could Julia, right. I think that's what we talked about before is doing all the partials on the on the homes to get those done and cleaned up for all of the reasons we talked about and then um doing a final with the continuing uh, condition relative to survivability. <laughs> okay, but at this point, are you still interested in doing a partial at all? Or why wouldn't you just wait and do one complete certificate of compliance at the end of the day for that would cover everything? I, we'll do whatever, however you want to handle it, Julia. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 
Um, it, doing the the final in December seems a little. Uh, well, I, I, mean, I said bye. I mean, basically, we have some stuff to do that'll be some landscape to be done, which will happen in September, and then probably while that is going on, we'll be putting together our information, beginning the process, and scheduling site visits with the commission and going through that. So we'll begin it before December, but I think we need to get the COC um, in December. Is that right, Lisa? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we got anything else? There's also the expiration of the order that needs to be looked at again as well. Well, we have the continue, yeah. we have the, uh, the governor's extension. Uh, when does that take? When does that take it to again? Well, it would be um, Six. yeah, it, it's next year, like yeah. two yeah, years next, beyond, right? Thirteen months July. from like Febu yeah. Fe last February. So yeah, okay. It's going to be thirteen months, so next July. Right, but we, now that we have an end of the uh, of the thing, we can actually calculate the the actual expiration date, so we all have yeah. that. All right, Sounds so we'll take care of that. But it takes us through the year. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Next item is uh, Jonathan Miller, 810 12 18 Colby Farm Lane, request for minor modification. Okay. So now we need to see who's here for the Jonathan Miller. I'm going to promote you to a panelist. Um, so that you can speak to this minor modification. Matt Hammer, also, I don't know and, if Matt Hammer. And Ma um, Jonathan, are you there? Sorry, I was on mute. Okay, is Matt Hammer with you on this? Yes, this he time? is. And, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna bring him over as well. I apologize. Okay. They have all this stuff to go through. Can you uh, mute? It's William Brown, please. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can uh, you hear me, um, yes. Julia? In, in, uh, yes. In, Thank you. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, Mad Hammer with Lamplex Engineering in out of Lowell. So um, we're here this evening uh, requesting an in insignificant change uh, to the order of conditions, um, which was issued for DEP file number 051-1031. And um, I could share my screen or- Actually, or you can't share your screen, but I can share this. Is this the plan that, that you wanna that, focus on? That, that's perfect, yep. Okay. So uh, the change that we're requesting from the board uh, is for uh, is for ten what is called ten Colby Farm Lane, and as you may recall, uh, this lot, which is also called Lot One, was part of an overall open space residential subdivision that the commission approved through an order of conditions, and this was a standalone parcel that was separate from the overall um, um, open space residential subdivision. So this particular, this individual parcel is a uh, single family dwelling. Um, in the addition that deviates from the original approved plan is the addition of a sunroom off the back, which is 12 feet by 12 feet as well as a proposed deck off the back. And I'd like to uh, note that those um, items that are extending off of the dwelling will be on um, sauna tubes that will be at grade and not a full foundation to the, to the initial um, dwelling that's originally proposed. So we've added the sunroom the deck in a, in a stairwell off the uh, back of the structure that deviates from the original plan that the commission approved. 
And if you all remember when we when you originally approved this um, subdivision, this lot over here that is separated from the other units, which are um, this is I believe the only single family unit on the in the development possibly. That's and, correct. Yep. Yeah, and this one is the one that's also closest to the wetland line, and we had them change the lot lines to get it out of the 25 foot no disturb, and then also put a fence and they've committed to putting signage on the fence to say that beyond this is a conservation area and wetlands protected wetlands. So, um, and then the rest of the um, backyard was allowed to be landscaped and yep. lawn. So this new deck area and proposed sunroom would be over what was to be existing lawn anyway. So it's not as though there's any new disturbance of buffer zone or wetland area. Correct, and I, I would like to add uh, to that, Julia, that, that that proposed work is still outside of that 25 foot no disturb zone. which is why you shifted it to this side of the back of the house, correct? Correct, yep. 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 Motion to approve. Second. All right, roll call, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. All right. Thanks Thank so much, you. everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. care. Julie, is William Brown still promoted to the? Uh, uh, no, I actually never promoted him, so he's uh, not. Okay. Um. I just see him in my. Uh, Oh, do you? A list of uh, yeah. people. Oh, let's see. He's not in my list, so. I just see him on the, in, in all the pictures, picture area, but that's okay. Okay. Um, all right, next next item is Klaus and Sue Kajer. I know I butchered that. Uh, 19 Francis Drive, request for minor modification. Okay. Um, okay, Francis and Sue, I think I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name. It's Kajer or Kjer. Um, if you are here to represent this minor modification, please raise your hand and I will promote you to a panelist. Um, this was prepared by um, Mary Rimmer and on behalf of the chairs. So I'm not, I'm not sure, I don't see Mary here and I'm not sure if anyone else is here as well, but I'm happy to represent the project after having spoken with them um, and correspond with them by email about it. It is, if I can open up the, um, their plan. As you might remember, this was back in 2020, this project was permitted. It is a single family home on Francis Drive and there's a wetland in the backyard, which you can see here by these wetland flags. This is to the back of the house. And, um, and then there's the buffer zone that, that I believe is the 25 foot no disturb zone um, with the dashed line. And the whole backyard was, um, well, this area of the backyard anyway, was sort of grass and weeds and sort of compacted soil. Um, the tree line is further back here towards where the fence is. And um, so what they proposed was a deck. They already had a, um, a stairway to the basement that they, or a bulkhead that they wanted to put stairs. They proposed this deck and a bunch of mitigation plantings within the buffer zone, which was approved. And the deck was a multi-level deck. So part of it was to be elevated at one level and then there would be steps down and you'd go down to another level of a deck. Um, they have changed their mind about that and they'd like to eliminate the, the lower portion of the deck and instead just make it a patio at grade. So really the only change is going from an elevated deck to an at-grade patio within the exact same footprint in the same buffer zone with the same mitigation as before. So that's why it's a minor, it's a minor modification. Um, 
but I wanted them to come before you with it because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just like changing the orientation of the stairs. It was going from a deck to a patio. And, and so I figured a minor mod would be appropriate in this case. Um, again, nothing else is changing with regard to mitigation or drainage or impacts to the bottom. No issues with any of the percent of the lot uh, vegetated and so forth. No, not on this one. And this is um, because it's not on Plum Island. We don't have those types of rules, but you're right. I mean, to ask, there's the existing condition of this entire area where the deck was to go was already very sparsely, it's very shady and there are a bunch of big pine trees. So it's very sparsely vegetated in that area. Just really um, some compacted soil and some lawn grasses and weeds and things like that. So by changing this from a deck to a patio, they're not having any additional impact on any vegetation that might've been in the area. The footprint isn't changing at all. Is this patio gonna be in, uh, impervious uh, pavers or? That is not, they did not give us information on the, um, on the materials that they're gonna use for the patio. I'm not sure if it's impervious or pervious. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, but as it's a single family home, stormwater management um, standards don't apply to yeah. this type of a improvement. So, um, I mean, I'm assuming that it'll, it would be overland flow towards the wetland in either case. Okay. I remember when we talked about this one, wasn't there a couple trees in the corner that we were asking them to yes. not cut down? And would, it, would a at grade deck uh, impact those root systems if we did tell them to keep them or did it matter? Any thoughts on um, that? My assumption would be that it wouldn't have any impact whatsoever because you'd have construction for the for the deck, um, shading underneath the deck, which wasn't even really elevated very high up off the ground anyway. So it's not as though anything could grow under there. But I wouldn't think that you'd have much more. I mean, maybe they have to, to dig a little bit to create a foundation for the patio um, with like a sub base or something. Um, but... I don't see how that would have a significant impact on any of those large trees. But if you'd like, we continue this and I can see if they can show up at the next meeting or get you that information. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to continue it and then and maybe ask them, you know, what material they're going to use and yep. and, and say we, we would prefer uh, pervious um, yep. if, if there's a choice. Sure. Yeah, if, if we can get some uh, pictures of the backyard too, yeah. that would be uh, quite useful. Okay, I will get back to Mary and to the applicant and let them know that we continued to, it would be the July 6th meeting and um, we'd like someone to attend to answer these questions if they can't get it and to get us some additional information ahead of time. Will somebody help me? Okay. I can't think of where Francis Drive is. What area of Newburyport are we talking about? Yeah, it's sort of off of, um, in the neighborhoods off of um, Turkey Hill, kind of oh, back okay. down there. Um, okay. I'd have to pull up a map to show you directly. That's okay, I just wanted to know what area. Yeah, it's down there. Okay. Motion to continue to July 6th. Second. Roll call, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Next item is uh, Louisa Tanner and John Watkins, 260 Northern Boulevard, request for determination. Okay. Good evening. Sorry. Um, Tom Hughes with Hughes Environmental Consulting. Um, at the last uh, hearing, we uh, we went over the project details, and from what I recall, with regard to the actual work on the ground, there were really no major concerns of the commission. I want to make sure that's the case, and then there was some 
questions and a little confusion in, ter in interpreting the uh, appraiser's report that we submitted. And we have followed up with some clarification on that matter. And uh, once I'm sure that you don't have any questions about the actual on the ground par portion of the project, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa, uh, Lisa Mead, who's here to uh, go over the appraiser's information with you guys. Yeah, I don't think I had any no, uh, questions of, uh, regarding that. Okay, so if we can turn it over to Lisa and she can kind of go through that aspect of the uh, of the project filing. Um, thank you, members of the commission. Uh, for the record, Lisa Mead, Mead, Teller, and Costa 30 Green Street in the report. Um, and uh, besides Tom here, um, Louisa Tanner and Jack Watkins are also on this evening. Um, so I know that the commission has some questions about the appraisals report or appraisers report. And then we had two follow-up correspondences um, from Greg story um, that we provided to the commission. Um, but if I could, I'd, I'd like to walk um, through um, his report a little bit with you and then have a conversation depending on where you want to go from there. Um, what I want to remind the, the board is that, or the commission is that, um, this is a unique um, property on Plum Island because it includes two buildings, um, which are referred to in appraiser's language as improvements, okay? So that's, when they look at a piece of property and has a building on it, they call it an improvement. So um, it includes two buildings. So the other added complication is that for the purposes of this calculation, uh, the commission, not just the commission, FEMA does the same thing, but you just have to look at the value of the building upon which the work um, is gonna be completed. So those two factors um, complicate and make it a, you know, a more complicated um, appraisal uh, for any appraiser um, to do the work. But so the way that uh, Greg did this um, was first of all, of course you have to find comps. And as he said in his report, there are no comps on Plum Island that are uh, two individual buildings on one lot. Uh, so he went through his whole analysis um, and he, so the first thing that he did was, and of course, these are the standards that under appraising standards is that he looked at the assessor's card and he determined what percentage of the value of the full assessment was assessed to the buildings. Okay. And under the assessor's um, calculations, 59.9 uh, or 60% of the value of the assessment is attributed to buildings. And so when he's looking at his appraiser, appraisal as a structure or property overall, when he looks at comps, he breaks down all the comps and this based upon that 60% value. He does a similar calculation for other buildings. So first of all, he looks at this as a, um, a value overall, and then he placed a 60% value on the buildings. So the total value a pre-renovation pre uh, was $980,000. That was his underlying um, appraisal that was attached, the first part of the appraisal that was attached to the um, submission to the board. So then what he has to do is look at and determine from an appraisal point of view, uh, what percentage of that value is attributed to this building, right? So there's two buildings on the property, what percentage of that value is attributed to this building. And he determined that because based upon square footage, it was 74.9%. So 74.9% or 75% of the total building value on this site is attributed to this building that's going to have renovation added on to it. So pre-renovation, that value is, is $416,000 on this building. So he applies the same methodology after the renovations. And let me remind you of, um, let me remind, so excuse me, I wanna make one correction. His original appraisal applied 70.7% .7 to this building because of the square footage. When the square footage goes up, the percentage of value of the buildings overall is increased in this building. So it went from 70% to 74.9%. Let me remind you that the total additional square footage on this structure is 474 square feet, of which, of which 111 is attributed to the stairwell. 
So we currently have a spiral staircase and it's gonna be replaced with a standard boat, a code compliant staircase. Um, and I think one of, the, um, one of the ways that you can look at this, um, we were, Tom and I were talking about this earlier. And one of the ways you can think about the value increasing or decreasing is that um, if you have a, if you have a new a, a kitchen, somebody buys a house and they have a fairly decent kitchen, but they don't like the kitchen and they replace it with, and it's cost them a lot of money to replace it. The, imp, the value of that house, so that structure doesn't necessarily improve by the same amount of money that you spent on that kitchen. The fair market value doesn't increase on a dollar for dollar value of how you improve the kitchen. So we're looking at 274 square feet with 111 square feet attributed to the stairwell. There is an additional bathroom for sure added to the master bedroom. But as Greg says in his second memo to you, that the master bedroom was in pretty good shape to begin with. So there's not a huge jump in value in the improvements in the master bedroom. You certainly have a get a value, you get a bump because of the bathroom that's being added, but you don't see a huge jump otherwise. Additionally, on the first floor where there's no new square footage added, right? A new bedroom is created by dividing a room. There's no question about that. And so a new bedroom does add some increase in value, but you don't get any new square footage. So that's offset. So his total renovation value of the whole property, right? Of the whole property is $1,050,000. That's the total renovation value of the entire property. And then he has to break that down just like he did um, the earlier valuation, the original valuation, what 60% uh, of that's attributable to the buildings. And then of that 60%, 74.9% now because of the increase in square footage is attributed to uh, the renovated structure, which gets it up to 472. Greg um, Story is a, a um, appraiser who works all over the state um, of Massachusetts. Uh, he appears as an expert appraiser um, on a number of civil cases uh, involving single family homes, divorce properties, interesting estates. He um, is an appraiser to an expert appraiser to a number of municipalities um, on takings. Uh, he has been cited in Lawyers Weekly um, over the last four years on numerous occasions as being a leading expert at determining valuations on uh, single family home and complicated properties. So um, we're pretty confident in the work that he's done. And I think that the hard thing about this particular renovation is that, um, you know, Louisa and Jack are being upfront about the work that they're doing on this house. Um, you know, they're not trying to show you that they're, you know, not putting in the roof that they're putting in or putting in a particular kind of window. But that all, all of that doesn't go necessarily to the fair market value of the property. And um, so I'm hopeful that that explanation uh, will give the board some comfort in knowing that um, this was done in a very uh, you know, acceptable appraisal manner. And um, it's a unique property. And the calculations that Greg did were appropriate. Um, and the total valuation um, over the original valuation um, is appropriate given the actual increase in square footage um, and the increase in usable space in, um, in the building. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, don't, I don't question his bona fides um, for appraising, but this is a, a unique property. We haven't dealt with anything like this and probably never will. Um, and I would like verification on, uh, on his valuation. Um, that's, I don't know how long that would take. I don't think it would take all that long, but I need some sort, I need some sort of uh, verification for, for his process and his final numbers. I, I, I agree. Um, even the explanation and the example he used about the stairway, uh, a non-compliant stairway being the same value as a compliant one, uh, just didn't ring true. 
It's a, if I could, I mean, his point is that from an appraisal point of view, it's a stairway. It's replacing a stairway with a new stairway. So, um, you know, it's like the, the condition of the bedroom. So you make the bedroom a little better, but it's still a bedroom nonetheless. But I hear what you're saying, David. Lisa, I also have a, a problem with the methodology. Um, he did a great job of explaining it and I do understand his methodology and it's a, a, it sounds like a legitimate methodology in certain circumstances, I'm sure it works fine. But in this case, we need to look at the value of just the one structure. And what right. he's done is he's taken the increased market value of the entire property because of this renovation and he's divided that percentage wise between the two structures. That alone to me is questionable. And I'd like a peer review of the methodology along with all the rest of it. Sure, I understand that Julia, but you have to remember that that's the way the property is, right? It's not gonna be sold as- Yes, but, we, but we're, we're only looking at the increase in value of the one structure. No, and I, what I, he did is he took the increase in value of the whole property because of the work on the one structure and he divided it between the two structures. But he weighted it, if I, if I could. But, that you, but he's weighting it, but he, again, weighting it, weighted it or not weighted, it's an increase in value because of the renovation, but he's dividing it between two structures, one of which it didn't get any work done and we're not looking at. Okay, if so, I could. I, I, it might just be, and again, you know, I'm not an appraiser, but to me, I'd like to see if there's a way to look at just the one structure. If I could, um, you, you have to value the property, right? And he weighted the improved structure appropriately because you can't separate it from an appraisal point of view. It's one property, you can't separate it out. That's the problem. And so I understand what you're saying, but I think if you get another professional appraiser in here, they're going to say the same thing because you can't go around the island and separate them out. It's well, not how it's done. That might, and that might be the case. And if that's not, if that's how it's done, that's how it's done. But I, in this case, I would agree with Joe and David. I don't know how the other commissioners feel. Well, let me ask a question. So on, on the pre-renovation, he assigned 60% of the value to the, to the building that's going to be renovated. Is that correct? No. Um, so hey, so the 60% um, of the 980, Steve, yeah. is assessed to both buildings, right? So that's the building value because okay. that's, that's the breakdown of the assessed value, right? On a percentage basis. And then 70% of that, of the building value, total building value was um, assigned to this structure, okay. the structure being renovated and on the, the- With the increase in square footage, that became 74 point something. Nine, 75%. Okay. Um, so, and what we're dealing with, if he goes over 50% of the value, then we have to raise the building on file, is that- Awesome. Right. And so that's a really interesting point, Steve, right? So even, so let's say if the, let, let's do the, uh, just as a, just to, as an exercise, right? So the total renovation value is 1,050,000, right? The building value is 630,000. Okay. That's the total building value of that. The total building value pre-renovation is 588, uh, $588,000, okay? So if you assigned the entire increase in value between $588,000 and $630,000 to this structure, you still wouldn't come close to the 50%. Right. Yeah, but I guess the part that makes me have trouble with this is, as Ms. Tanner mentioned, I believe, I didn't go back into the recording, but she mentioned something about a value of around 200000 that was going to be put into this. 
And I know what you said as far as not getting all your money out of it in value, but I mean, we're at, we're at a factor of about four or five as far as uh, you, you, you're only getting about a quarter of the value. It, that David, there, there's no question about it. There's that's in, and it's because of the kind of renovation that it is. You don't get all of that money back. Doesn't I'm that not, seem I'm, like a, a quite a percentage? And so I mean, she got. So just so you know, she actually got. Um, hang on a minute. I have this written down. She got quotes between 115 and 200. So there was a pretty big range of quotes for the construction. She has not hired anybody yet. Well, what what if you uh, just did it by the second method? What percentage would that be? Well, so the so here's the problem: the assessed value again. The assessed value includes both buildings together. Both buildings together under the assessed value is four hundred and eight thousand dollars. So if you saw if you use Greg's methodology to split it up then 260 is at 306 and 260A is at 102. You just you lost me there do... at the end. Pardon me? You just lost me there at the end. So just 200, uh, this building, this building pre-renovation, if you use the assessed value, if you use the, if you use Greg's percentage, right, of what value this is of the two buildings. So they mix the buildings. They don't separate the buildings. The assessed value of the buildings together is $408,000. So you have, to, you have to separate the buildings, right? That's the point. So if you do the 60%, um, no, excuse me, the 70% uh, separation of the buildings, then this building is worth three hundred and six thousand dollars under the assessor's valuation and the other building on the lot is a hundred and two thousand dollars under the assessor's valuation I, I, which is I, why I, you it, chose the other method yeah i mean we're we're, we're well, taking a unique complicated well i mean you you, you say it's a unique uh, situation and um, I guess the fact that there is such a discrepancy in the value that they get back for me means and I'm not an assessor in any way shape or form so I mean for me I'd like to have somebody that does understand it that could explain this discrepancy to us I mean it shouldn't be a problem the way you're describing it to get uh, someone else to do a peer review David, I'm, it's not, again, I, I have great confidence in Greg, I, and it's time, it's time and more money, that's all, and that's the, you know, I'm just, it's time and money to get, essentially, you know, he would have to be off by over $270,000, that's not going to happen. So, I, you know, it's, it's a unique thing, and we're probably never going to run across it again. Um, and in order to, to bring the, the post renovation value up by several hundred thousand dollars in order to go over the 50%, I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, so I would not be in favor of having a peer review, but if everybody else wants to, that's fine. Thank you. I don't think it's I think I would tend to agree with Steve on, on this one. I, I don't. I can't really follow all of these numbers that are being thrown around, but I but I do have the feeling that it, no matter how we slice or dice it, it's going to come in less than fifty percent, and uh, we may not you know we may not like it, but um, that's the way it is. Lisa, do you have any idea how how much it would cost and how long it would take to get another uh, review to get a peer review? Well, it's probably going to cost between three and four thousand dollars, and I would just guess, given the work that I do, um, it's going to take a while because these people a aren't around um, and they're really busy given the real estate market. 
Um, and not everybody's going to be able to do this job. Uh, like a regular bank appraisal will not be able to do this job. It's going to have to be somebody who's got pretty significant experience. That's why we went with who we went with. Yeah, I'm, I'm not looking for this to be extra work either. I'm just looking for somebody that has uh, a better background in this to just uh, a, a, agree with this. I'm not, I'm not looking for somebody to start, even if it's just reviewing the mythology of this. Yeah, I, I, I guess the, 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 the hardest thing I have to understand is, is why part of the increased value of this new house part of that cost is being slumped onto the other structure I, mean, I understand you say that it's all one property but i, I believe that mo most of the um ordinance and regulations etc refer to structure not property when you um uh, mr healy when you do an appraisal like this the mm -hmm. um Right, you have to include, like if you do a comp, right, or you're doing an appraisal for a bank, um, you appraise the entire property, including the structures. You don't, you don't separate out the structures. And so um, when you go to get your comps, you have to understand how, you have to be able to pull those structures out of the total value, right? So, um, so for example, a comp that has a water view, right? may be different than a comp that from a structure point of view or a land point of view, may be different from a comp that's in the middle of the island, right? Um, so you add on top of that, the two structures on the lot and you've got to figure out a way to apply a value to each of them that meets the comps that, that you are looking at. That's but, part but, but, but what why does the value of this secondary house change at all? Because the entire value of the property is increased by the improvement of one of the structures. But we're not allowed to look at the entire, that we're only looking at the one structure and Paul's right. You've attributed some of the increase in value of that structure to the other one. And- I understand it, that. It just, it, that's what was done. And, and it doesn't meet our, the way our regs are written and, and what we're, the, the entire point of our regs, which is to look at improvements to a single structure and right. then what that means. Well, no, actually your regs say, what is the pre-construction and the post-construction value, right? right? And on a property like this, you have to run through the same analysis that you have to. And so that's what your regs say. What is pre-construction value and not post-construction value? No, I, I understand that, um, but we just want to look at this anyway. Um, Dan, Dan, you got any comments on this? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's being such a complex property with a complex appraisal. Oh, what what are we going to do? You know. I'm inclined to to um, to agree with Steve and Paul. I, I I don't know that a peer review is going to be an efficient or effective, um, you know, um, process at this point. And 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 you know we're not even close to the fifty percent. So if it's a matter if it's a factor of ten percent or twenty percent. It's still not even going to get there. So, yeah. Ron or Carol? The only thing I'm wondering is if there's something that um, Attorney Mead can send us. I mean, short of having somebody else review the property, if there's just some literature or some um, something to help us understand this process. She said that this. Uh, uh, Valuation expert has been published before and and is quite well known in the community. So maybe there's something that would just give us a little bit of better feeling for the process without having to go through another review. I don't know. That's kind of a middle of the road uh, approach, but maybe that would help. 
So I've given, um, you obviously have his um, CV and everything, and um, he goes through a significant explanation in his appraiser, uh, appraisal about how he came up with this, and he goes through that, an additional explanation in his post-construction appraisal, and then in the two additional letters. So Carol, I don't think there's like a, I, I hear what you're saying, it'd be great to say, oh, here's the, you know, the last uh, newsletter on this kind of thing to, uh, there, I don't think it, I don't think it exists. There isn't something regarding the standards that, that appraisal appraisers use that would help us to understand what the process he went through. I mean, I, I can certainly ask him to provide to you appraising standards. I don't know that it's going to help. help I, do, I do think this is a really unique case. I think that he did go through um, the standards for appraisals and the different methodologies and why he chose the methodology he chose in his report. And, um, but I just feel like it doesn't jibe with our way our regs um, want us to look at this. And that's what I'm struggling with. Um, Julie, if I can just um, interject a little bit. I mean, uh, this may be, you know, um, ex exhibit A of, of the limits to the regulations. I mean, they can't, they're not going to be perfect. They're not going to accommodate every situation, but that's what we have. So we just kind of have to roll with it. You know? I mean, we can't, yeah. we, we can't rewrite the regulations because we have a, a, a situation that doesn't really, doesn't fit within that. Within no, and, and the, and the appraisers methodologies to choose from the sort of array of methodologies which they use don't offer themselves um, to our process either. So it's an imperfect situation. Yeah, for me, I think, you know, and I can't evaluate, I don't have an answer for my concern, but if this sets a precedent that would appear down the road to be used in other circumstances, uh, that would be a concern of mine. But what I'm hearing is this is such a unique situation that that would not be the case. You know, um, I think that there are no other properties like this on Plum Island, right? So, so that's that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, because of that, it's this has been you know obviously an expensive process to go through, um, but actually you know you get real information here, right? So. And I think the other the other part of this is that's difficult is the kind of construction that it is right within the limited within the limited improvements that are being made. So um, I don't think Ron, you know, it's going to be it's going to set a precedent because it's that it doesn't exist anywhere else on Plum Island. I'm sorry, my internet's a little unstable. I missed that. And Lisa, this isn't considered a 60. This two dwellings on this one lot is not something that can, they can't be divided. No, it just existed. Uh, no, it can't be divided. You'd have to get a variance to do that. And that's not going to happen at all. No, they would even be too small for that. And um, this existed before the adoption of any of that. So no, it can't happen. All right, well, I am... I am hearing that uh, the commission is not inclined to uh, ask for another appraisal. So in that case, what do you sounds, want to do? Sounds like a jump ball to me. I haven't heard Carol yeah. weigh in and I haven't really weighed in yet. I heard two and two and three maybe? No, three and two. Mm -hmm. So. I'd just like to say, I, I, I agree with the idea that um, any peer review of this might may be unlikely to push the appraisal over the 50% um, rule limit um, if, if it were to change it at all. Um, but to me, this, this change in value and this structure with adding a master suite, a new bathroom, a new deck, 400 and some odd square feet of living space, a renovated first floor, stairs to code, 
entirely new siding, new windows, new framing, new, new roof, all that. Um, a full renovation plus bedroom, bathroom, decks, et cetera. To me, an increase in value of $50,000 for that doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. And because it's such a complicated appraisal and it's hard to understand the methodology and how that works with our regs, I, that's why I wanted a peer review more, not necessarily change the end result. And so maybe in that case, it's not worth the time and expense, but to help um, understand whether or not this appraisal and the way it was done was correct. Can I, can I just say something? So just a couple things, Julia, so that we're all talking about the same thing. So there's 274 additional square feet, right? And there is a master bedroom right now, but it does not have a bathroom and a closet and it's getting bigger. So there is a bedroom up there already and, it, and you access it through that spiral staircase, um, which is gonna be replaced. And on the first floor, there will be an additional bedroom, yes, but it's not any additional space, right? It's dividing a room that exists, mm -hmm. not even pushing that wall out. It's only merely dividing the room that exists. So I do all, all the stuff to the exterior. You're you're correct. I'm not I'm not questioning that, right? But I do want to I do want to be clear that we're not adding a new bedroom on the second floor. It exists. It's becoming larger and it's getting a bathroom for sure. Yeah. So so can. You are we saying that if uh, if somebody ha has, a, say, a one-bedroom place, it's a large bedroom, and they cut it in half and make two, that doesn't change the uh, the evaluation, the uh, appraised value? No, I didn't. I, no, I didn't say that. I said I what, what the way Julia was explaining it. I thought I what I heard was that it. I, I took it as being more grandiose than what it was, right? So I didn't say that. In fact, I think Paul, when I originally commented, was that yes, there's an added an added bedroom, and it does have added value. Right. No. No. no I'm just. I'm just thinking from the uh, from the um, appraiser's point of view. Does having now three bedrooms instead of two make? Does that go into their? Uh... Yes. They. He. He gives. Uh, you know, I'm not going to use the right word here. But he gives credit for certain improvements that add value, but don't you know, like don't take it over the top, right? So right. yes, he gives credit to the added bath, the added bedroom for sure, and the right. added bathroom. Yeah, and the what about the new new siding, new roof, whatever? Does it? It doesn't really. I mean, there's some value there, but negligible. No. Why is it negligible? because it already has, it's already in good condition. So it's a condition issue. So as he describes it, it's already in good condition. It's just gonna be in better condition. It's not like it's falling down and falling off. Well, I mean, you take the roof, for example. I mean, the roof has somewhat of a finite uh, amount of time that you can get out of it. You're increasing that significantly. Right, but from fair market value, so I'm not an appraiser, like I'm just gonna be, no, you know, but from a fair market, I ask him all these questions, right, David? So from a fair market value and appraisal point of view, that is not a significant issue. Well, yeah, I guess in, in my sense here, uh, and the reason I'm going in, in this direction is, is just that I don't have any experience in this and I don't, I'm not looking for somebody to redo the whole thing. All I'm looking for is somebody to check the methodology of this. That's the way I feel. And, that, and that's my <clears throat> that's my position too. That's pretty close to what Carol suggested, I think. Yes, I was trying to figure out if there was some way to, short of having a whole new valuation done to just get some get somebody it, to weigh in on what happened, what, how this was done. Because I don't think any of us are, nobody's pretending this yeah. is our area of expertise. At least not mine, for sure. Yeah, that, that's basically the peer review is uh, get get verification that this is a valid method. And because um, I'm not a I'm not an appraiser either. And this is a, a complex setup and some of the numbers don't make sense to me. Um, and that's that's my point with wanting someone to uh, to look at it. 
Julie, is, is the uh, city assessor capable of doing something like that? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I could ask them. Um, I don't think that they do appraisals um, the way they do assessments because they're not, uh, but I don't know. I mean, may Lisa, have maybe you know. on who might be able to do this type of review. There is somebody the, the that the city, the city has used a, an appraiser in the past for different things that, so there are people we could call on, but it, we would have to pay them or they would have to be paid. Well, can we, can we at least get it run by, <clears throat> run by the assessor, the city yep. assessor? And, and if he says, if he has no issues with it, then she, he, she, sorry. <laughs> as if I know these things. Um, yeah, if you, if you could ask her and just to take a look at it and see whether it makes sense. Is this something, I'm sorry, but you know, I'm still quite new here. Is, is this something that would necessarily be paid by the, um, the people who are asking for this or is it, does it ever become our responsibility? Generally it's uh, for, for this, it would be the uh, applicant covering the cost. Yeah. If we can get out of it for little or no money, I'm totally fine with that. But I, I need some assurances that it's... Yeah, it seems like we can do that and carry it over to the next meeting. It's not an unreasonable request. If Julia, you think you can just run it by your town folks? Yeah, I will run it by the assessor, um, assessor's office, but if they say this isn't how we do things, this isn't something that we feel comfortable weighing in on, then, you know, are we waiting three weeks just to tell the applicant that um, we need to continue? I'm, I'm not sure if that's the most efficient use of time either. So, I mean, maybe, Lisa, do you have any thoughts about how you'd like to see that go? Um, yeah, I'd like you to vote tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I, you know, look, I hear, I, I hear what you're saying. And I, you know, I think maybe uh, Jill and is it Mike in her office? Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they have to evaluate appraisals that come in as part of, um, as part of um, abatements. So, um, you know, they might be able to, it's a different, assessing is different than appraising. Um, but you know, they, they certainly know how to read appraisals. Uh, my issue is, you know, what are they going to give you? And I, you know, I don't want to be here six weeks later. And I, I really, I would be, I have to tell you, I would be shocked if this thing, you know, changed by $230,000, right? It's not, it's just not going to do that. And, um, so, you know, and a peer review is a peer review. It's a review of the methodology that was used and whether or not it's an acceptable methodology, right, with acceptable results. So, you know, I, I suspect that Jill and I think it's Mike, right? Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, I suspect that they can take a look at it and review it. Okay. Isn't there some way we could um, come to some? have some review of the information or come to some conclusion before the next meeting? Are we allowed to do that under the rules in terms of uh, having it be a public hearing? Well, I guess I wonder if you could, um, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what the board wants to do because, you know, if you issue the determination with the condition that they kind of bless it, um, that's okay before the issuance of the CO. But if they don't bless it, then you've already issued the determination, right? So um, you wouldn't be meeting the condition under that. I know. Well, so we'd be back here, I guess, is my point. We'd have to redo everything, right? Right. Well, um, I guess I, I agree with Lisa um, that even if we did have a peer review, I don't think there'd be an increase in value that, that would get you to the 50%. Um, yeah, that's my peer too, and um, and, and also, I, I, you know, I, I'd just be very surprised if um, 
anyone like you know from the uh, city from city hall or or even uh, a, a different um, appraiser would be able to come back and say that no no the method that uh, this person used is wrong you know, i don't think I, I just don't see that happening you know so it's, yeah. it's I, I i don't really like the, the way it's playing out but it's since it's not marginal, since it's not going to change, likely change the end result, is yeah. it worth it to do this? Right, yeah. I mean, if, if we were looking the them having come out with, it's going to increase it by 40 to 45%, and we thought it was wrong, and then a peer review maybe would change that. Right, we're, yeah. We're not even close to that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing. If it, if it was really well, close... You know, you'd say, oh, oh, they forgot to look at this. Well, going back to the other method, Lisa, if you did do it the other method, what uh, what percentage would we be at? Well, I don't, you know, so if you, if the, if it was 306, and the question is, what's the construction, right? I mean, you look, this is part of the problem with the other method too right now, construction costs are through the roof that doesn't necessarily go to value, right? A piece of plywood that was, you know, $14 a sheet two months ago is $45 a sheet today, right? So, it, you know, if you use the $115,000 quote, then you're under the 50% at the 306, right? That's the assessment. What are you at about 33%? And if you use the higher number, what if we well, took the average, just just not for any particular reason, just but my curiosity. Right. So that was let's call it two hundred thousand, right? That's the higher number. So that would be right versus the three hundred six. So that'd be over the fifty yeah. percent. Right. See, that's the part that kind of concerns me. Yeah, but there's, but you've got two different, but the problem is, is I, know, I know, I know you have different it's the property, ways. Right, it's just, right, right. I was hoping that, that it wouldn't quite go that way and that we could just let it go with that. But that's the part that gets I have me. to tell you, if construction costs keep going up and, you know, it doesn't matter for this property because this, you're going to, I think you're going to see different, different things happening. It's, it's, it's getting expensive. Well, and that would definitely fall through the today. value of the house. We'll do what? We couldn't hear you. We'll do what, Lisa? Oh, it won't go to the value of the house, the increased construction costs on a reno like this. Well, <clears throat> I think we've gotten to. Will you keep an account on? <laughs> where we are on, as a board because uh, if, if if it is going such that the, it's going to be approved then then maybe we can it, just make it simpler for ourselves it appears we're outnumbered david yeah if, if that's the case so be it so do i hear a motion I'll make a motion that we do not do a peer review. Oh, very good. Okay, I'll second that. All right, roll call. Paul Healy? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Dan Warshaw? Yes. David Vine? No. Ron DeCola? No. Carol Wagon? No. And I vote no. So the no's have it? So the no's have it. Okay, now back to the project. <laughs> <laughs> that was just for his motion. <laughs> well, but is it possible to, before we ask the, the applicant to take on that additional expense that we see if there's some information we can get from the folks at City Hall and then make a decision or is, are we just running out of time here? So here, here's what I'd like to do to just get this done. Um, can we please tomorrow, Julia asked Mike and Jill, yep. if they can look at this and if, if they can't, um, then, uh, you know, my clients will immediately, you know, 
hey, you got to hire somebody right away, right? And so that we have a review done by the next time we're here on July 6th. Because yep. I, I do not, you know, it's really, because all your, with all due respect, and I, and I certainly respect because it's different and I understand what you're saying, it's, it's not going to change $270,000, right? So you're going to have the same result, but maybe somebody's going to explain the methodology better or say that it was okay. So if we could get it done, um, either by Jill and Mike or to, that says, yep, yeah, this is legit and, you know, it is what it is. Um, you've got all of the reports. They can call Greg. He will be available to them. Um, and if not, immediately hire somebody else. Yeah, yeah that was going to be my point is that I, I don't think this should go past the sixth. I wouldn't want to wait until then to then de decide to do a full peer review. So I will talk to um, Mike and Jill tomorrow. But what I'm not understanding is if Julia gets information that would help us um can we make a decision before the six or do we need to wait till the six yeah no, we, we have to week. wait till the six okay we have we have to officially vote on it yeah all right so we're looking at a continuance to july 6th yes right. please thank you lisa got a motion motion to continue Second. Uh, roll call, Paul Healy? Yes. Steve Moore? Yes. Dan Warshaw? Yes. David Vine? Yes. Ron DeCola? Yes. Carol Wagon? Yes. And I vote yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item is, uh, make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself here. Next item is Lorraine and Michael Riley, uh, to Spofford Street, amend order of conditions, and Tom Hughes has asked if this can be uh, continued to the July 6th meeting. Motion, Motion to continue. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait. Don't we need to open the public hearings? Are we in, it is public hearings, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't highlight my uh, thing properly. Yeah, Ms. Mr. Chair, um, I, before, before you do that, I just wanna point out, we had a notice issue on the abutter notices which is why we can't actually open this hearing we just do need to continue it so that was why my request but um motion to open the public hearings Second. Second. all in favor aye. Aye. aye opposed okay um do we need to open this you... first to continue it? Uh, it it was properly notified in the in the newspaper so you need to um open and continue but not discuss yeah yeah that's fine Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so motion, motion to continue to July 6th. Second. Roll call Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you. All right. Next item is Jack and Beverly Murphy, 3 Marsh Street, notice of intent. Okay, here. All right, this is a request for a substantial improvement and I'm going to promote Matt Steinel to a panelist so he can walk us through this. At the last meeting, um, they presented this um, notice of intent, which is for a proposed addition to the single family home on Plum Island and um, I'll bring up the plans. And um, this is the new addition. And the commission at the end of the meeting asked if um, if this was a substantial improvement and we hadn't received that information, it hadn't been requested. Um, so Matt provided the substantial improvement form as well as calculations to show that it's not a more than 25% increase in square footage. So Matt, do you wanna go through this? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, Matt Steinel from Millennium Engineering. Um, as uh, Julia explained at the last meeting, uh, I think the board in general uh, had a good understanding as to what was being proposed uh, at the property, but there was a little bit of 
uh, a gap in, in uh, our expectation that we were going to provide the board with uh, substantial improvement form. So we were asked to go back and do that. Um, we went back and we worked with the, uh, the owner who's a builder. Um, he produced the cost estimate for doing the work. As you can see here, Julie is pulling it up. And his uh, assessment there showed that, that we were uh, well within, uh, well below the 50% requirement for the substantial improvements, uh, as well as uh, Julia asked us to look at the gross living space calculation, uh, which we provided uh, separately on the actual plan itself. If you want to go back to that, Julia, I can, I can point that out mm -hmm. as well uh, yeah. in that upper right hand corner. So you'll see here that there's a little bit of confusion um, between what the assessor's record says and what we are providing. Uh, and I tried to explain that, um, but basically the assessor shows the area of the house as being essentially confined to two floors. They call it the first floor and the second floor. They don't speak to the main ground level, which we're calling the first floor. Uh, and that is a, a finished uh, living space area there too. So when you add the additional, you know, basement or ground level floor to the overall calculation for interior living space, our number comes up to 2513, whereas the assessor had it at 1788 when you don't include that lower level. If we assume the assessor's numbers, worst case scenario, uh, the total increase in living space is 23.5%. So we're just under the 25%. If you include the ground level floor, which we believe is the correct way it should be handled, then the total increase is actually only 16.8%. So in either scenario, uh, we're under the 25% requirement for the living space increase. Um, as far as uh, other changes, this did go before the zoning board recently, and uh, there was some uh, discussion from the homeowner after the meeting uh, that, you know, in order to, to make everybody feel a little bit more comfortable with this, although he would love to keep the shed because it provides the additional storage that he has enjoyed all along, uh, he'd be willing to give up the shed. So uh, earlier today, I revised this plan to show on the proposed side that the shed is to be removed. Uh, so that additional 189 square feet of shed space, which really doesn't help us on the living space area, we don't need the help, um, really doesn't help us on the 50% uh, rule. Again, we don't need the help. But as a general environmental uh, impact to the site, uh, we believe it's an improvement to remove that structure from the property. So uh, he was willing to make that uh, concession there, I think, to make both uh, you folks here uh, more comfortable with the project as well as uh, the people in the zoning uh, board as well. Um, I think that was pretty much the limit of what the commission had uh, issues with at the last hearing. So I'll, I'll answer any questions that the board has. Um, with the removal of the shed, are they going to plant some um, appropriate vegetation there instead? We, yeah, we can do that. I don't think there was any uh, discussion of that, but if the commission wants to make that a condition of uh, any potential approval here, we can uh, ensure that the list comes from the CZM, the plants come from the CZM list of approved plants. Um, probably similar vegetation as is being proposed to be removed from the right-hand side of the addition area there kind of those low lying ground, you know, shrubs or something similar off of that list. Uh, also, are those uh, the pavers leading to the shed going to be removed? Uh, well, again, <laughs> uh, details that we didn't discuss. There was a last minute change to the plan. Uh, I don't see a need for the pavers other than they originally turned towards the entrance to the shed. Um, you know, we could probably at a minimum remove a portion of them if you wanted to keep it as a walkway from the driveway area. Uh, but the driveway runs along the side of the building there anyways to the backyard. So I think uh, a portion of, if not all of the pavers can be removed. Yeah, I think if you at least remove the ones that went over towards the shed, that would be helpful. I think the, the, the reason I'm hesitant to say they're all going to be removed is they lead not only to the entrance to the shed, but they lead to the entrance to the fenced and backyard. So it's, you know, if we remove a portion of them, but he still has it as a walkway to the fence gate, you know, then he may be willing to remove. Uh, I can't, you, I can't control the mouse, but essentially from the, where about the middle of the word pavers is there uh, to the stockade fence would likely remain as a walkway to that gate. And, and then from about the middle of the word pavers back towards the street could potentially be removed. Okay. So we could say something like a portion of the existing pavers that are necessary to lead to the shed, which is to be removed, will be 
also removed and the remaining pavers necessary to lead to the backyard and stairs may remain. Absolutely. And, and we would be open uh, to that condition as well as uh, if the board wants it for the record, we could revise the plan as early as tomorrow and have it back into the department so that we'd have it for the, for the complete file. Uh, that would actually the be the easiest way to do it. And then it's just in the approved plan. Okay. Do we have anything else? Uh, anything from the public? Raise your hand if you want to speak. Seeing none. Motion to close the public hearing. Good. Good. All right, roll call Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Ron Ticola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Next, we have uh, Priscilla Geigas, Mass DCR, North Reservation Terrace, Notice of Intent. Okay. Um, and for this project, I'm going to promote several people to a panelist, Greg Robbins, um, Mike Driscoll, David Smith. Is there anyone else representing this project? You can raise your hand. Otherwise, I think we're good. Okay. So for the um, representatives from DCR and GZA on this project, um, I have obviously the notice of intent up here on the screen and you can just, um, if you'd like to unmute yourselves and you can let me know um, where, how you'd like me to scroll through the um, application in order to present it to the commission. Great, thank you, Julia. Uh, David Smith here from GZA Geo Environmental, uh, here representing the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. And I am with Mike Driscoll, who is a project manager at DCR, and also Greg Robbins, who is the director of waterways. <clears throat> this project, uh, this notice of intent was filed um, for the proposed beneficial use of approximately 165,000 cubic yards of sand material as, as beach nourishment on Plum Island Reservation. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, is conducting a maintenance dredging project to remove 290, approximately 290 cubic yards of sandy material from the Newburyport Harbor Federal Navigation Project limits. And under the federal base plan that the Corps is proposing, approximately 125,000 cubic yards a material will be placed on the beach at uh, Plum Island Reservation to protect the inlet South Jetty and uh, the area commonly called uh, the spur, the South Jetty spur that you see in the aerial in front of you on the, uh, on the southwest side of that spur. Uh, that's being placed there to pre pre uh, pre prevent flanking due to uh, coastal erosion. Under the federal base plan, the remaining 165,000 cubic yards of material is scheduled to go off or near shore at the two disposal sites off of Salisbury Beach and also off of Plum Island. These are permitted disposal sites. Section 204 of the Water Resource Development Act of 1992 allows for the Army Corps to change uh, the disposal location for the purpose of beneficial use. The city of Newburyport made a request to the Army Corps of Engineers to, um, to have a section 204 study done and an assessment and it determined that the dredge spoils can be placed, uh, the remaining 165,000 cubic yards can be replaced at, on Plum Island Reservation. DCR is the non-federal sponsor of the section 204 beneficial use and as the Army Corps has all their permits to be able to do their project, 
which is to place 125,000 cubic yards of material, which includes the methodology and, uh, of placement and also the dredging work. And what um, the non-federal sponsor has to do is be able to secure the state and local permits associated with this work. Julia, uh, if you could turn to the plan. Okay, sorry, go ahead. That's it. Yep, uh, this will do, but actually the drawings are further down. Uh, sheet, uh, page 45. Great, thank you. So as I mentioned, that the, uh, this is an Army Corps of Engineers project, and what they're proposing to do is hydro hydraulically place the material onto the beach. The 125,000 cubic yards is that white area sort of to the south and east that flanks that South Jetty Spur. The gray hatched area, correct, yep, is the, uh, the Section 204 limits, which is uh, the area to the northwest. Uh, the core will hydraulically pump it onto the beach and uh, place it in, in the manner as shown on the drawing. The crest height will be brought up to an elevation uh, of 6.8, and that's an NAVD 88 datum. It's approximately 400 feet in width, uh, sort of that rectangular, roughly a rectangular shape of both the, the core's limit and also the section 204. And then it's going to transition down at a 10 to 1 slope going seaward out into the deeper water and also to the north and west uh, to match up with the existing grade. The, the core is dredged um, the Merrimack River, um, I, I believe it's 15 times since the 1960s. And the last time it was done is in 2010. And that material was also um, a beneficial use and it was placed um, with 120,000 yards being brought uh, to Newbury Center, and then also 40,000 yards was brought to Salisbury at that time. So it's a, a similar uh, beneficial use of that dredge material. Prior to that, it had been dredged back in the 1990s and it had gone uh, to the nearshore disposal sites. Um, <clears throat> the um, resource area impacts, um, associated with this um, placement of material is, let's bring it up here. We have uh, land under ocean. We have land containing shellfish. We have fish runs, coastal beach, barrier beach, land subject to coastal storm flowage, and a riverfront area. And the square foot of values are uh, as what was presented in the notice of intent. Um, land under ocean is about 347,200 square feet. That also includes land containing shellfish, fish run. Coastal beach, barrier beach is 45,750 uh, square feet. And then coastal storm flowage and riverfront areas, uh, a little over 7,000 uh, square feet. What this does do is by the placement of this material onto the beach, it eliminates the impacts to the near shore areas at the two disposal sites, which uh, totals about a hundred, a little under 173 acres of, of impact. So by placing this onto the beach, those impacts will not be, um, will be eliminated. Um, this is a project that is time sensitive. Um, we are expediting the permit permitting as, as feasible. Um, in order to meet the Army Corps' uh, requirements of securing all the permits for the Section 204 before they go out to bid. Um, they are looking to get this on the street this summer with work to commence uh, over the winter time uh, within, within the short window of the time of year restrictions that they have to work with. Um, we have filed uh, an environmental notification form with MEPA. Uh, that was done on May 17th. The comments are due, actually was due today, and then we'll be getting a decision on June 25th. In conjunction with that, and in conjunction with the filing of this notice of intent, we've also filed a, a Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection Chapter 91 permit um, with DEP, and that's uh, in the works as well. Um, 
And so we're trying to trying to get all the permits in hand by um, at least June, July timeframe to be able to get back to the core with these uh, with these permits in hand. So th this project, um, in summary, it's it's placement of suitable compatible dredge material. Uh, it's consistent with the Massachusetts Executive Order um, 181 for barrier beaches, um, which states dredge material is compatible, that has a compatible grain size, shall be used for beach nourishment if economically feasible. This is also consistent with MassDEP's guide to um, beach nourishment and also consistent with the City and Reports Beach Management Plan. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Dave. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Um, excuse me. D uh, Dave, um, I, I don't quite, um, could you explain the sequencing of construction? What, what keeps, uh, how, how you accomplish this in, in deep water and so forth? The construction methods are, are being, this, this is a core project. Um, so my understanding is that it'll be hydraulically pumped to this location. Um, there'll be um, barriers placed around here. So it you know is able to just stay onto the beach as has been done before in the past at these onshore locations. And um, once the material builds up, there'll be um, excavators, bulldozers that will be placing it to the template that's, uh, that's shown. So you, you're gonna build it from the shoreline out? Is that the, what I'm hearing? I, mean, I, believe that, I believe that's gonna be the case, yeah. It, it makes the most sense. Okay, so you're gonna just keep pumping it, pumping it, changing the shoreline and pumping it and then finally, when you get to the end, I, I guess the part I'm having the most trouble with is what's going to contain all of this, uh, aside from gravity, as far as uh, slumping uh, into the deeper water. As you're building it. Yeah, D Dave, I don't, um, as I mentioned before, it is a core project. Uh, we don't have the, you know, details as far as the actual placement, um, you know, the means and methods, um, other than just that it's going to be pumped and equipment on the beach will be um, creating um, the crest to that elevation and then creating the side slopes. Would it be okay if I jumped in here? Yes. Uh, I think it's just helpful to remember that the side slopes are 10 to 1. Um, so this is a really shallow slope. It's not going to be prone to sloughing any more than a natural beach would because 10 to 1 is, is generally considered a, a natural beach slope. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, one question I had is, assuming the city puts up that uh, core bag um, structure, will this go up against that? Will it bury it? Um, what what will be the what will happen with that, or will it be removed? I don't think it's appropriate to appropriate for us to speak for the city, um, but I'm comfortable sharing that I believe it's my understanding that they're in sort of a wait and see mode. Um, that if this project is, it does move forward on the schedule that they're that they're planning right now, um, that that may not happen. Um, but that isn't that by no means is that set in stone and I'm certainly not a representative of the city so I, I couldn't okay. speak more than that. No that that's that's what I heard too but I'm just wondering if it was there what would happen. Um, I, I know they got to put sand over the bags to preserve them too so I guess we'll find out we'll wait and see. So what does that mean Joe it's just a question of timing as to which project gets done when? Yeah, well, I think it's going to depend on if, if the Army Corps project gets delayed and it could get delayed, the city will most likely put up the uh, uh, the core bag uh, system. So when is this this project, the, the Army Corps project, scheduled to actually happen? 
sometime is, in the winter? Yeah, late late fall, um, somewhere around the September time frame, if oh. all goes according to plan, and then end um, mid February. So they'll be able to do that during the winter months when there's storms and all that. Does it matter? That's when they have to do it. The, there's time of year restrictions that require that they only do it during that time frame. September one to May thirty first, correct? Yeah, I think it's actually earlier than that. I'm sorry, that. not May. Yeah, um, April yeah. April first. Yeah, and I think actually, um, I think it may even be. If, if it's in water work still taking place, I think that's bumped even further to February. Oh. But um, it could be April if, if they're only doing land-based grading at that point. So I'm sorry if I missed this, but so the, the whole project is gonna take that many months or that's just the time frame in which it can happen? That's correct. That's just the, the window of opportunity for the work to be performed. Thank you. So just just to the northwest of the end of this project, you know, over where the couple of the walkways come out from the parking lot, there, there has also been considerable erosion. Um, this this plane isn't going to do anything about that. Or um, just up to the footprint that's shown on the on the drawing here. Okay. I would expect it would at least slow down that uh, erosion, but I guess we'd find out. Okay. I hate to be so negative, but if, if in fact this is in the process of being done and, and there is a storm and the material leaves the footprint of the uh, filling. Uh, what what what's this? <laughs> what what do you what, what can you do about it? I think that'd be the case if a storm occurs after the project is done too, right? I mean, it's material yeah. that's going to be lost. I don't know how the core contracting language is going to be. If a storm happens during construction, I'm sure there's some ability, you know. Um, that the core has, I, I don't know uh, off the top of my, you know, I don't, I don't have that information. It, the the project I mean, is still in the development phase as far as the uh, the contract bid documents. In the um, in the notice of intent, you mentioned a tow berm, which would be constructed to hold the or to sort of attempt to keep the material in place during construction. Can you explain a little bit about how you construct that tow berm? What it is where it is, um, how long it's expected to last work for? I believe if it's like prior jobs, this, the berm is created from sand. And it's it's created around the perimeter? At, at what elevation? I mean, so you, I'm imagining you're trying to create sort of like a boundary for it within which you're gonna pump the sand. But if that boundary is underwater, land underwater, it just it doesn't seem stable enough if it's just loose sand um, to, to serve any purpose. The, the idea is to contain it while it's being pumped enough so that the water can escape and the sand will, will settle out. Um, so is it like a moving target, this tow berm? That it uh, that's correct. Up? Yeah, oh, the, the, okay, they're going yeah, to they're gonna have pipes that are going to be um, uh, I, I imagine that can be extended and 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 taken away. Um, you know, so obviously I don't want to uh, push sand. You know, a thousand feet with a bulldozer. They they would just pump it with with pipes and um, just place it in these particular areas, almost like you'd do it for uh, you know hydro seeding or spraying bark mulch in a in a mm -hmm. you know in a planted area. And then they once they fill in with it within a certain area, they move that back and then fill in and then move it back again. Kind of that's thing. correct. Yep, that's my understanding. Okay, all right, that's helpful. Yeah, one one of these sections shows it doesn't go really that deep. I mean, where the first section is, it's it's not that much below mean low water. Uh, going 
west, it, it starts getting deeper. So it will get a bit more complicated. Well, core can do it, right? They've done it before. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's different than the one in 2010, though. I mean, that was all on an established beach. Mm. True. Does the, um, the report talks a lot about water quality. Does is there any consideration given to the sand quality that being put on the beach? Is there any uh, experience uh, what comes out of the bottom of the river? Uh, the court the court did testing back in 2016 of the uh, of the dredge areas. There was quite I believe there was like 10 or 12 samples that were done, um, and then also samples that were done onto the beach for compatibility. And the sand that was um, tested is about 96 percent sand that that's in the dredge material. So it's um, it's it's compatible sand to the beach. And I guess it doesn't. Uh, sand doesn't hold uh, contaminants like clay would, I guess. That's correct. Yeah, it's too, too coarse grain. Yeah. Okay. Where's the uh, construction vehicles going to access the, the area once they start shaping this and so forth? Yeah, to the, to the left of the drawing, um, there's a pathway that leads from the the project area out into the parking lot that's to the to the east of the boardwalk um, they're going to be um, accessing the equipment through that pathway and the staging area will be part of that parking lot right now that pathway has a moby mat on it and fencing on either side is that going to be wide enough for you to get your equipment through or are you going to need to widen it uh, my understanding is the core is going to be removing the fencing. They'd be removing the Moby mat. Um, it, I think the narrowest point there is about eight feet. It's as wide as 12. Uh, yeah, so they'll remove the fencing so they can have more space. Will they go, be, so they'll widen it essentially. Um, enough just so yeah. that they won't damage the fence, yep. Okay, and the, are they going to put down any other kind of mat to get over that area, or are they just going to drive over the sand? I believe they're just going to be driving over the sand. Okay. So there, there should be some sort of um, requirement for replanting of, of any dune grass that gets damaged and destroyed, because it will, I'm sure. I believe that is all covered under the core permitting. Crossing the dune, okay. Yeah, there, there should be some documentation of the condition of it before construction yeah. so that they can get it back. I think it's mostly poison ivy in there anyway. There is some of that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Drive over that. So we'll need to replant the poison ivy? <laughs> I do. Uh, what else? We got anything else? Is is this going to be going on twenty four hours a day? I'm not aware of the time frame. I, I don't know, Greg. Do you have any insight on that? I don't. Um, I only know that we can't control the core. Um, the base plan for this project, uh, the, the lighter colored area of the, of the placement that you see there is something that the core is, is doing on their own and without the need for our involvement. We've asked them to do this extra piece, the, the dark or the gray piece, and um, that, uh, that's what we're trying to permit. And that's really the, the piece of this that we're trying to help the core with and because of how they implement their projects, we don't have a lot of say in it. Um, we try and get what we can, but if we if we push too hard, the core's response is, "We'll find and we'll just do it our way and and not your way." And we're trying to avoid that if we can. Okay. Uh, we have anything else? No. 
My, I have a question about public access real quick um, during construction, because this is a huge area. It's a huge amount of sand that's getting placed. If you also, if you include the sand being placed, the 125,000 um, cubic yards further to the south. Um, so, and it's going to take a while, I'm guessing. Is there going to be some plan for managing public access, keeping people out essentially, because it might be kind of dangerous? Um, are you going to put up signage, fencing? What's the plan for that? Again, this is this is a core project. Um, we don't. It, it's up to them. I imagine that as part of this work, just for a sheer public safety, there's going to be, um, you know, this will be cordoned off. Certainly, to be in a very active site when the equipment's going to be spreading the sand. Um, Is there any plan for planting um, after construction or stabilize trying to get some of this planted new dune? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, yes, we've been in, in discussions with CZM about the, 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 our intent and our desire to do it and the need to do it. Um, but because of the permitting requirements necessary for this and then for that subsequent work and the speed with which we're trying to permit this project, uh, if we don't have the permits in place, the Corps basically said, we're not going to do your project, so we're going flat out. Uh, we haven't addressed it now. But one of the reasons we're not too concerned about that is that if this is built on schedule, which means it'll be done sometime, you know, roughly February, March of 2022, then we wouldn't be doing any substantive plantings until the following fall. So, you know, once we get through this permitting process and this, and this is correct, we can start to have the discussions that we need to have with uh, not just the permitters, but also with the community about, you know, what needs to get planted, where it needs to get planted, any potential yeah. changes to dune access, that sort of thing. Uh, it's not it's not something that we wanted to make really quick decisions on. It's something that we wanted to be well thought out. And so that was a big part of, of why we haven't included it in all of the permits uh, that we're filing for. I, I'm just thinking that it might make sense um, to just throw a condition or two into this order conditions that allows specifically allows for DCR, the state applicant, or the city to go in and do planting on this within this area post post nourishment um, of native species, clearly American beach grass um, and whatnot. So that because that's pretty simple. So just so you don't have to come back and for a separate permit just to put plants in the ground, um, even though you might not have the resources or anything lined up to do that type of work now, a condition could go in that would allow it to happen. If, if you're comfortable with that, we're certainly not going to object to it. Uh, one of the concerns that we had is we didn't feel like we had planned enough about what would be planted, where it would be planted, and how um, to really answer, you know, the substantive questions that we typically would expect from a CONCOM. So mm -hmm. if, you know, we, we've worked with you before on these types of things. So if, if the comfort level that's been developed is, is acceptable to you to, uh, to condition it that way, we'd, we'd certainly welcome it. Yeah, I, I don't know, commissioners, do you feel comfortable with that? They could maybe submit, we could put in a condition that they could, if they submit a planting plan to the commission, that the area could be planted with native vegetation. Yeah, I'm good with that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Easier. Yeah. Let's make the project easier. And uh, maybe if we can do a final, you know, sometimes you check projects, Julie, at the end to see that mm -hmm. actually did what conditioned it to be done. You can put that in there too. Yeah, yep. And and at whatever point they can submit a planting plan to uh, to Julie for her approval. Yeah, it doesn't have to be required, but if they're not ready to do that, it could be something that is allowable that way they just don't have to come back and get a separate permit to essentially do the last step in this project yeah yeah the, the only concern we would have is that if it's conditioned in such a way that it prevents us from approaching the project the way that we would want to um, yeah. and and i don't think the condition the commission would do that on purpose it's more sort of the unanticipated consequences of some language so i would just say um, you know put some forethought into it if you can and, yeah. and be as general as you can just because we don't want to put ourselves in a box it, it could be something like in order to help stabilize the newly placed sand the applicant may um plant american beach grass or other native species as necessary um, within the within the order of conditions time frame, 
Yeah, that's something like that yeah. would work would work well. Um, you know, the types of things that that we need to consider. You know, this isn't just oh, we're going to run in and do beach grass. It's it's the density of the beach grass. It has to be balanced with the ecological impacts to shorebirds. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking at you know this desire to have some woody species in there as well because it helps. Okay. Um, uh, you know, it helps yep. protect the dunes as well as 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 mitigate unwanted okay. crossings that sort of thing. I see what you're saying. So you would be anticipating actually putting together more um comprehensive sort of planting program for this whole area in which case it, maybe we do want to wait i mean my own my only concern is that if it's done now it, we don't want to do something that would preclude an appropriate approach later that yeah. is all if if you're yeah. comfortable uh, conditioning it that way, you know, we'd certainly accept that because it's going to save us save us some effort later. But my only point was I wanted to to share some of the competing interests that we need to balance. You know, if we we're doing it just to protect the dune, we would want as dense a vegetation mat as possible. If we have to address ecological issues, then we have to sort of change that density mm -hmm. in certain spots. And 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 we want to do it right. Is really right. And there will need to be there will need to be pathways eventually. Um, designated through these areas as well for the public to reach the new beach. So that'll have to be looked at too. So if, the, if something goes in, I understand what you're saying. If a, if a condition goes in related to plantings, it should be as, as general and as open as possible. Um, yeah, we would appreciate that very much. Yeah, I, so I know far, I would. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead David. Joe. Um, so far, you haven't got any comments back asking you um, about planting, or you just haven't gotten the comments back yet? We had a, um, a pre-application meeting with the agencies uh, several weeks ago, and we also had a MEPA scoping meeting. That topic didn't come up at either meeting. Okay. I can, I can add that prior to the permit process even beginning, we've had uh, discussions about that with CZM informally, and they would be one of the primary commenters. Um, and I, I think one of the reasons why we, pro we probably haven't heard more is that they understand what our intent is here and, and that we are intending to do it. Um, and so they're probably a little less worried about it than they normally might be. Yeah, I, I, would, I would personally love to see uh, something other than beach grass bushes and you know beach plum and, and whatever put in there for habitat purposes and, and stabilization. So yeah, if we can be as general as possible, I'm totally good with that. Yeah, actually as, well, as in, I'm sorry, sir. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, uh, given all of this, I, I wonder if maybe we'd be better served to not include anything in this uh, order of conditions. Because somebody, it sounds like somebody could take it the wrong way and just mess everything up. And since you're planning on, on doing this as a later thing, you're going to have to file anyway. Just take care of it then. Um, would that would a minor modification? It could be that, yeah. Yeah. Something. No, no, no I, 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 from what I'm hearing people say, I'm, I'm worried that some agency is, will, will get upset. Because True, it could be done just as an amendment. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, if we're something now, they're going to worry. And that's going to delay it. Yeah, that, uh, does that work for you guys? I think we're comfortable with going as far down the road as, as the commission is comfortable with. Um, yeah. uh, you know, if you if you conditioned it appropriately to allow it to happen with with some leeway, I, I think we'd we'd be in pretty good shape because our plan is to work very closely with all the permitting agencies. So I'm not too worried about them. Oh. Um, but again, it's what you're comfortable with. You know, what you do, you need to be comfortable with and, and think is the right thing for your community and um, if, if you want to condition it so that we can do it at some point in the future, we would definitely welcome that. How about something like this? The applicant may establish native plantings in the project area to help stabilize the dune after nourishment in accordance with a planting plan to be um, reviewed and approved by the commission. Yeah, that works for me. 
Yeah, yeah that works. That works, Julie. And, and as Greg had mentioned, this will be a fall planting. So this this template, you know, that's going to be placed here over the winter time may not look, you know, in the same footprint or orientation here in the fall. So I right. think uh, a, a, a plan that needs to be submitted just prior to planting would be ideal. Okay. okay. And would you want to include uh, sand fence as part of that condition? Yes. Is fencing not included in the application at this point either? There was some language in there about fencing and plantings. Um, How about this? The applicant may install sand fencing and established native plantings in the project area to help stabilize the dune after nourishment in accordance with the planting and fencing plan to be reviewed and approved by the commission. That works. Okay. All right, do we have anything else? No. Okay, uh, anything from the public? If you wanna comment, raise your hand. I am not seeing anybody raise their hand. I have one more question though oh, before yeah. before you all close the public hearing, which is that um, with the last project on the with for the core bags, um, you know, closed the hearing, issued the order of conditions, and then and then Division of Marine Fisheries, uh, yeah, Division of Fisheries and um, Wildlife came out with this long list of conditions that they wanted us to specifically incorporate in our order, but our order had already been issued. So we had to go back and do that modification. Um, is there, does it make sense? And I don't know, Greg or Dave, you can tell me if this is would be problematic with regard to the MEPA process, but if, or chapter 91, if we waited to issue the order of conditions and continued this until the final comments come back from fisheries and wildlife and the other agencies so that we can incorporate what they want us to incorporate. Um, sure. I mean, we, we can certainly do that. Um, I think I'm, I'm looking actually at the letter that was done for the core roles, and it seems like most of the comments had to do with if any changes um, were made to the plans that needed to be have um, an updated approval. There was time of year uh, restrictions, which I imagine that's still going to uh, apply to our project. Um, sand cover on the on the bags, and then um, also the ability to have a monitor uh, for piping uh, plovers if it was um, after the April 1st deadline. Uh, compliance report and as built, that's something that we're going to be doing uh, anyways. Yeah, and those are all those were all yeah. sort of things that we either in some way already incorporated into our order of conditions or was easy to put in. Um, but they wanted us to specifically have each of those seven conditions, even though it would duplicative to some of the ones we already had. They wanted us to put those in our order of conditions. So we had to bring it back and amend it. Um, it's a process thing. It wasn't that big of a deal. We could do it again. Um, I'm just wondering, do you need the order of conditions in order to get the MEPA certificate or the chapter 91 or is it something that can wait so that we can just do this one time rather than twice? Uh, we are, we, we do need it for the uh, chapter 91 permit. We don't need it for the MEPA certificate. Um, that should be issued on um, the 25th. So we're trying to hope to be able to submit the MEPA certificate and the order conditions to chapter 91 to expedite that review. Okay. Well, yeah, and our next meeting wouldn't be till July 6th. So it sounds like it help it helps you if you get the order of conditions first. It, it would it would save a week or two, yes. Yeah. Okay. And one other reason why we would be interested in that is because the core needs us to have our permitting in place uh, based on what they say now, but at least I think very close to in place or as much in place as possible before they will commit to building the additional work. 
uh, when they go out to bid. So the more we have in hand, I think the stronger hand we have for them to continue procurement of the 204 placement in addition to their base plan. So that's one of the reasons why we're going so fast that we filed kind of out of order. We're, you know, we're working the, we're working the, the calendars and the review time periods that are required as, as much as possible. So we get we can amend later if, if we need to, <clears throat> or we could just put those seven order conditions in that we think they're going to ask. And try. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some well, they don't. Them don't apply. Some, some but... don't. Yeah, don't don't apply. Um, now we can put the ones in that do apply, and just have them have them sitting there. And if yeah, they, yeah, we can certainly incorporate the time of year restriction, even though that's already in the notice of intent. We can we can um, sort of just make them feel comfortable with it like that. It didn't make any difference last time. They still wanted it, but uh, I, I don't suppose saying that this is going to have to be built in accordance with all the other agency comments is, is uh, fulfilling or not. I, I, I they probably based on the last time they still probably going to want us to do it that way. No. We, then we can we can amend it. It's not a big deal for yeah, us. So. I think amending's the way to go. Okay. Um, all right. Um, any questions from the public? Mm -hmm. uh, Mark only the right. Yep. Okay. okay. Motion to close the public hearing. No, hang on, Steve. Oh. We, we have a uh, question okay. for the public. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Mark and Leela Wright, you want to unmute yourselves? Sorry, I might have double clicked on them. Can, if, can you get nope, they should be, yeah. Nope, yes. can hear you. Yes. Just for the record, I'd like to be strongly support moving this along as fast as possible and doing any amendments that are required later um, as time is of the essence as has been uh, demonstrated by um, by, by both the gentlemen that, that have spoken tonight. Okay. All right, anybody else? All right. You get a motion. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Roll call, Paul Healy. Yeah. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Ron DeCola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Um, why don't we uh, to vote put this thing forward it was just a motion to close the public hearing don't uh, have to that's vote. correct that's how we get to uh issue an order conditions that means our discussion is closed on it right uh okay can uh can i get a motion to close the public hearings so moved can i get it all right, Paul seconds. Uh, Paul I think we just, we just did that, didn't we? No, we closed it for the for that, and now we're closing the. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank God. yeah. All the public hearings. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, let's go to order conditions first. Okay. So. The only order conditions, wait a minute. I think we have two, don't we? We do. Perfect. Well, no, we don't have two. We just have, um, because Marsh Street, three Marsh Street, oh. We have Murphy. No, three, three Marsh Street was, a, um, was approved and um, the special condition was that the applicant shall plant native vegetation in the area where the existing shed is to be removed. And that um, prior to issuance of the order of conditions, er, the applicant shall provide a revised plan showing removal of the 
pavers that are unnecessary, um, unnecessary pavers leading to the existing shed right. along those lines. Those are the two conditions for that one. Yeah. <clears throat> Make a motion to issue that order of conditions. Second. Roll call, Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Rhonda Cola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. Next order of conditions is Priscilla Gagas, Mass DCR, North Reservation Terrace, Notice of Intent. And for this one, there were two special conditions. The first is that the applicant shall provide documentation of the condition of the pathway from the parking lot to the beach, the access pathway, pathway that they're using for construction, to from the parking lot to the beach prior to construction, and any damage to dune vegetation associated with this pathway shall be mitigated through replanting of American beach grass in the planting season immediately following construction. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. And the next one is that the applicant may install sand pens and establish native plantings in the project area to help stabilize the dune after nourishment in accordance with a planting and fencing plan to be reviewed and approved by the commission. Yep. Motion to issue that order of conditions. Second. Second. All right, roll call. Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Yes. Ron Dakola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. And I vote yes. All right. I sent out uh, an email to everybody uh, regarding uh, the installation of Tenth of a mile marker, um, adopt the trail mm -hmm. signs that Jerry Mullins had installed along the uh, Gloria Brownhart, Brownhart bike trail. Um, he did not um, look for permission or, or you know look for a permit. Um, a lot of these are within the. Uh, the buffer, wetlands buffer. Um, Julie and I talked earlier about this um, and we came to the conclusion that uh, Jerry should uh, at least remove the uh, signs off of there, off of these posts. Um, he, he, ha he hasn't gotten any, he, he didn't discuss it with the city at all before he installed these. He discussed it with Coastal Trails Coalition um, and I assumed they put him in. I, I have no idea who put him in. Um, and uh, I think we need to discuss the, uh, what we wanna do with, with this. Um, Cause it, there's no, there's no agreement as to who would get any get any funds from the uh, from the from the advertisements that are supposed to go on these things. Um, and Jerry, in the, the email he sent, he just basically said it was more convenient for him to get this done now than uh, and then to discuss with the city later. Um, so. I don't know what I, I'm all ears for what people think about uh, what should we should do. Um, supposedly he's now he's good with 15 days left in the month. He's going to uh, go uh, and work on the damage that he did uh, by digging up soil and putting it on the roadbed. Um, but, you know, he, he's he's doing what he wants out there. Joe, I wonder if the 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 signs. I mean, are, are how how many of them were placed within our jurisdiction, and even if they were, um, I'm not sure. Does that necessarily a violation of 
of uh, of the of regulations? Well, he he installed them on city property first of all. Right. Um, no, I under, I understand that, but I'm just I'm just trying to dig down into what if it because that isn't really a concom concern. I, I, I he should ask the city. I mean, the city should be saying, you know. You can't just put signs in without getting permission, but I, is, is that our jurisdiction? <laughs> um, in part, it is. The, the, I know way back when um, Bill DC did a, did a delineation, and he said that the entire roadbed was within jurisdiction. Um, I can do... I haven't done a uh, um, a GIS map of that area, but I probably could do that. Uh, and um, definitely say how much of it is within jurisdiction. Um, I'm pretty sure at least nine tenths of a mile is within jurisdiction. Because there, there's streams all over the place there. I feel like we're we're not having a lot of luck in in uh, establishing control with uh, with the situation. I wonder if it might be more powerful. It came from a, another entity um, in in another way. Maybe it yes, and you you know you know destruction of property or public you know de you know, damaging public property, something like that might get, might get us attention a little bit more than we have been able to. Um, you are segueing into um, my, I was going to ask the commission uh, if we wanted to essentially send a letter to the mayor uh, because Jerry has a signed agreement with the city about working out there. And in that signed agreement, he says he will report any, or Parker River will report any wetlands violations. He, he's the one committing the wetlands violations out there. Um, and I know this, the, the mayor told him to cease all activity, um, yet he had these signs installed. So I'm, I'm wondering whether the commission should send something to the mayor asking that she um, void that agreement um, and do something about this. Joe, I think that when we when we went out there and had that visit with Jerry, I remember you. I think you raised the question about those signs. I, I probably did. I, I can't remember. I remember, um, and then you said you wanted those taken down. Oh no 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 those. Um, I don't, he wanted to do advertising signs or something. Yeah, these so. are these are advertising signs that were just put up. Um, but there's no advertising on them yet. Correct, but but my understanding is his plan was to have Parker River get any revenue from those ads, um, and he you know he was gonna he said in his email he was gonna discuss with city council and um, you know I. I don't. Uh... He's just premature. He he just went out there and did it because he wanted to. But it's city property, so putting signs and starting a program for collecting, raising money for something on city property without talking to the city about it is just not the right way no, to go. No bueno. No. Um, and I I would like my my preference would be to for the commission to basically write an official letter to the, to the mayor um, explaining this and um, asking to have the, uh, the agreement nullified because he's just not, it, he's just causing more damage than, than he's uh, taken care of. And, and also in a couple of weeks, we're gonna be meeting with uh, what's that groups that, uh, company there, Julie, the land manager? Oh, Land Stewardship Inc., yes. Um, we're meeting with them at the end of the month to talk about um, possibly helping the city out with just managing, overseeing, doing planning for our open space areas, including trails. 
Um, and so it may be that they can take over some of this work that Jerry's doing if that's something that the city feels is necessary. So I, I ran into Lise Reed the other day when they opened the, the new part of the rail trail. And I asked her about whether the parks department was going to take over the Gloria Brown Hart, um, bike trail. And she's more than willing to do it. Doesn't have the staff or the money, but it's not her decision to make. And according to her, there's been no further discussion of, of that happening. Uh, I don't know, Julia, maybe you know something that- No, we haven't had any more meetings about it. Um, I do think it's something that we should talk about. Oh, I, we have had one, one or two meetings about it and it's been thrown out there. Um, it is a staffing and, and funding thing. So maybe that's why it sort of stopped in its tracks because it involves changing budgets and looking at staffing and things like that. It, um, but well, maybe we need to see what this Land Stewardship Inc. group thinks about what their abilities are, what kind of funding and resources Lisa would need to do that piece herself. Um, and whether or not it just make, maybe it makes sense to let Jerry keep doing it, who knows? Well, it seems to me that if there's, there's a question of the jurisdiction here, who, who should be controlling this trail? And we've, we've talked about that before. And may, maybe the thing to do is just to, I think as Joe was suggesting, send a letter to the mayor expressing what our concerns are. And I think it's probably her, her call. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think we'll go that way too. And the other issue is with parks that the trail would need to be added to the ordinance that specifies parks. That, that was, that's another thing that um, all the, their jurisdiction is all uh, codified in the, uh, in an ordinance. So that it also needs to be added uh, to that. Um, and, and the reality is most of the things in our jurisdiction, you know, and, and he's not getting permits for it. He's just doing what he wants to do. Yeah. So we, we do have authority there with regards to uh, enforcement. And uh, this meeting with uh, um, this group on, at the end of the month will coincide exactly with the uh, with his deadline to fix the mess he made. So it, it may all be good timing to, to basically give him a cease and desist and, um, and not allow him to do any more work out there. But Joe, do you think we need to have some formal decision or ask, make a formal request to the mayor? I, I would like to. Julie, what do you, what do you think about that? I think that's always a good idea. I think we need to keep her in the loop on all this stuff. I know she's busy, but this is something that the city has to make some decisions about. So it should she should at some level be involved. Yeah, and and, and he also ignored her telling him to not do it do any more work out there. Yeah, and and in the past, I feel like he's gone to her and gotten agreements for things, and you know, without us knowing about it necessarily, and so. We just all always need to be on the same page with this stuff, I think, because it is a little bit discombobulated that we don't want things to start um, getting more confusing. So I think, I think a letter and then I think a meeting with everyone would be a good idea too, including Jerry. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fine with that. But uh, you know, initially, I think the mayor has got to, I don't think she's going to be happy that he did this no. after she told him not to do it, right. not to do anything out there. So, go. Oh, I like the idea of the letter. I'm in favor of it. I say we go go ahead, um, and then as far as the parks department taking over maintenance, I mean that's a whole separate issue. And and they're they, I think they're they're stretched to their to their limits yeah. their limits as it as it is anyway. So I, I don't hold a lot of hope out for that happening. And but regardless, um, yeah, I, I'm in favor of the letter, and I think we should. We should go go forward. Well, when I talked with Liz, she said she's in, including in her budget what she feels is everything she needs for staffing and to get the job done. 
So is she including that in her budget? I don't know if she was including that or not. Um, okay. But I, I think right. she's looking for an increase in her budget and staffing. Yeah. Well, tell her to include it because she's not going to get everything she asked for anyway. So she might as well put that in there and that'll give them one thing they can cut away. Right. She, she might not get responsibility for it anyway. So. And, you know, I think I think that's a good point. And I think that um, in terms of I'm talking about keeping everybody on the same page, we haven't been keeping Lisa in the loop on what we were thinking about with this land stewardship Inc. group. So maybe we just need to invite her into that conversation as well. I think that would be good. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there may be, there may be property in the city that they have responsibility for that they haven't really had a good opportunity to, uh, to maintain properly, and they, they might want to get rid of some responsibility. Right. Yeah. Okay, okay, so um, Joe, do you want to draft something or send me some bullets and I can put it on letterhead and send it back for signage? Okay. Um, why do we want to, should we vote on sending something to her? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we send said uh, letter to the mayor. Second. Um, roll call Paul Healy. Yes. Steve Moore. Yes. Dan Warshaw. Yes. David Vine. Um, I, my only hesitation here is, is this letter ending in us saying that we're recommending that you, um, terminate this because I'm not for that. You're, you're not um, for that. I'm, I'm more oh. in favor of laying out the situation. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, just uh, like, like, um, laying out our concerns, right? Our concerns. Uh, I mean, I, I don't. Um, I'm just afraid we're going to end up in a, I, I guess it really doesn't matter. We don't have that much power on this anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, and what, what's going on out there as it is anyway, isn't working. So, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think she's yeah, going to be. Okay. I vote yes. I vote yes. That, that was my concern. <laughs> you answered it. All right. Rhonda Cola. Yes. Carol Wagon. Yes. I vote yes. All right. I'll throw something together. Um, and it doesn't need to have that because I think she's going to be pretty pissed. That I actually don't mind the signs being there as long as they don't have any ads on them. Well, yeah, no, same with me too. But and where and know where the money's going. That, right. That, right. That if he's generate. raising money for an adopt a trail program. We should know about our own adopt a trail program. Yeah, on on city property. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I'll do that. Um, do we have, uh, we don't have anything else, do we? I got, we I got yes, two. Go ahead. Go, um, go ahead. What, at our last meeting, we talked about whether that 25% increase in square footage was cumulative. And I, I thought there was going to be some discussion of that today, or Jennifer Blanchard was going to come in and yeah, we'll have to put that on the agenda for another meeting. And, and I can talk to those guys. I'll talk to Jennifer and Andy about doing that. Um, yeah. I didn't put it on for this meeting because we, we had kind of a full agenda and I figured, you know, save it. But it is, it is something that we need to discuss. So um, the sixth, maybe, I'll, I'll ask Andy and Jennifer. It would be good to have both of them. And the other thing <clears throat> is my favorite harbor master um whether he's made any progress on the shed out there and getting it raised or whatever if we could get a report from him did we not close that out last year no. No. he did raise it he yeah had, had, the last i knew he didn't have any money to raise it I thought he maybe, the maybe i'm wrong but i don't think so oh well, we can look that up yeah. I, thought we I thought we closed yeah, I that thought out. It was done. Yeah. Was it Reed's Ferry going to come out and do all that work? Yeah, I, I, I thought did. he didn't have the money to do it. Oh. I'll, I I'll dig back out uh, all the notes from last year and figure out what happened with that. Okay. I know Gretchen knows. Yeah. <laughs> Gretchen knows all. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh oh. Um, the last time I was out there, it still had the lattice around it. Okay. Which probably means it didn't get raised. 
I don't think it did. <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen. It's like the never ending problem. <laughs> that thing. Okay. Can we find him? He has plenty of money, that's for sure. At least, I, I mean, the Harbor Master account usually you know, does. Money for the trail. Anyway, uh, yeah. I don't think. All right. Do we know um, if our next meeting is going to be live? Because I think all the uh, restrictions expired today, and I don't know that the state government got it together to change the law. So I think we have to go back to live. Yeah. Meetings. I've all that made ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, what, that's what we did tonight, basically, <laughs> because, yeah, as of, as of last night, we were all supposed to go back to in-person. No, I think it's as of today, so we're still in compliance. Oh, we are? Okay, because I talked to Lisa Mead yesterday, and she said she was asking what we were doing, and I said, well, we're having our meeting. And she, I said, it's, I, I, was, it's I was assuming today. that it, it, okay, I thought it was midnight, and Lisa told me it was midnight last night. Do you think we're okay? Well, I don't know. I think but... they extended it to the fall, didn't they? Trying to. They were... Yeah, there was legislation pending, or there was some, you know, government act, governor's action, but it didn't happen, as far as I know. But I don't know for sure. So I just it didn't happen. It didn't happen it yet, and it could it be happening then. right now. So, Julia, if we do have to go back to in-person meetings and at the senior center, can we do it in the larger room downstairs instead of jamming into the director's room upstairs? Mm -hmm. Oh wait, I'm wondering who's who we're hearing in the background talking. Um, I would, I've been trying to say it's been extended. Oh, it's it was Gretchen. Today, 90 days. It was extended. Okay. Oh, it was extended today. Oh, excellent. Okay, all great. Right. Well, so never mind. Gretchen. Gretchen. Gretchen knows all. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to say it. Now, yes, ball. I do. <laughs> oh, good. I hadn't heard that. As of this morning, I it has it wasn't done yet. That, that's such good news. Yeah, um, but there's a lot of other people who want it extended too. Yeah, but we will have to come up with a way to do hybrid meetings eventually, and it's going to be a little complicated. Um, we'll have to get some training, and we'll probably be back at the senior center. My biggest concern was we we when we were trying to share the city council chambers with the city council, and we had our Tuesday nights always scheduled. We kept getting bumped, and then we'd go upstairs and we'd get bumped from that room. And that's why we ended up at the senior center in the first place. Now they're talking about how ev having everybody do their hybrid meetings at the senior center. And my response was, well, that just means we're going to get bumped even more often than we did before. It would be in the parking lot. Yeah. So anyway, we'll we'll figure it out. But um, this is great news that we get ninety more days. We get down the road. Motion to adjourn. Oh, you killed Joy. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. All righty. Okay. Good night, Good night everybody. everyone. Good night. Good night.